Buenas tardes a todas y todos. Quiero darles la bienvenida a, a, nuestra, a, a nuestra conferencia hispánica. Good afternoon to everyone. I would like to welcome, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee and the participants, to uh, uh, this uh, day where we will continue to explore issues of relevance for the international, for the Hispanic community, for the Latin community, and for the society at large. Uh, this has been a tradition of the law school that we started uh, some years ago to create a, sp a space to analyze uh, the crucial issues of relevance to the society at large. Uh, uh, today, you will hear uh, from a distinguished panel that will en uh, enhance our understanding of crucial issues at stake. This is uh, not for the purposes of uh, thinking that uh, addressing those issues will solve them, but it certainly will enrich our ability to work together to mobilize the, the society in order to achieve a better world and a better nation. Thank you again, and uh, good luck, buena suerte, con estas deliberaciones. We are fortunate to have people of tremendous quality participating in this panel. Thank you, Dean Grossman. Uh, buenas tardes a todos y todas. Bienvenidos to the 22nd annual and first ever virtual Hispanic Law Conference. My name is Sandy Arce, and I am a member of the Latin American Law Students Association, otherwise known as LALSA at WCL, in commemoration of the Latino Latina Hispanic Heritage Month, the Hispanic Law Conference celebrates the vast diversity of the Latinx community. During this three-day event, you have heard from leaders across the Washington DC area, representing a wide variety of industries, including many HVADC members and WCL alumni. In the conference program, you'll find the biographies for all the speakers, award recipients, and a keynote speaker. This afternoon's feature discussion is focused on the impact of COVID-19 on the Latino Latina community. As the last of the three-day program, we are closing our conference by celebrating the award recipients and hearing an exciting moderated conversation with Dolores Huerta, the president and the founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Now, I would like to introduce Professor Macarena Sainz, who will moderate this afternoon's first panel. Thank you, Sandy. Um, thank you, everyone. It's a real pleasure and an honor for me to be part of the Hispanic Law Conference. And it's really an honor for me to be able to moderate a panel, an interdisciplinary panel. I think that one of the things that um, we legal, in the legal field we do very poorly is have uh, interdisciplinary conversations. But we can't really speak about COVID-19 and the impact on the Latinx community without really expanding um, the disciplines in which we have these conversations. So it is my pleasure to have this very distinguished panel and, uh, and to really moderate because it's not my field. So I'm here to really learn a lot and, and try to understand this uh, really difficult and, and terrible impact that uh, the Latinx community has suffered not only within the United States, but I think that COVID-19 has had an impact in, in all uh, Latin America as well as a region. Um, so today I have uh, with me, and we will be, if we will physically, we will be in, in the same room, but uh, the one of the, the few, I guess, advantages of this online um, world is that we can have these conversations with people who are in different places. So with me today, I have Dr. Elena Rios, Dr. Uh, Daniel Lopez Ceballos, and Dr. Juan Pablo Gutierrez. And uh, I will introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. So I will, we will first hear from uh, Dr. Elena Rios. She's the president and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association and president of the National Hispanic Health Foundation. Previously, Dr. Rios served as the advisor for regional and minority women's health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office on Women's Health. It was, she was the executive director of the Hispanic Serving Health Profession School, the coordinator of outreach groups for the White House for the National Health Care Reform Task Force, and policy researcher with the State of California Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. 
Dr. Rios had lectured, published articles, served on board of directors, and received several leadership awards, including from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Congressional Black, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American Caucuses, Association of Hispanic Health Executives, Ryzen's first Pollen Community Service Award, and Ameri Group. Dr. Rios is very, very accomplished. Uh, she earned her BA in Human Biology, Public Administration at Stanford University, her MS, PH, uh, Masters of Public Health at the UCLA School of Public Health, her MD at UCLA, UCLA School of Medicine and completed her internal medicine residency at the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and the White Memorial Medical Center and her NRSA Primary Care Research Fellowship at UCLA Division of General Internal Medicine. Dr. Rios, um, I know that you have a PowerPoint presentation and uh, Sandy Arce will share the screen with you and we'll, we'll follow your lead on, on that as well. Thank you. You're, you, you can unmute yourself as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, this is our uh, National Hispanic Medical Association website here, nhmamd.org, for more information. Uh, next slide. Uh, I thought I'd just start with an overview of the Latino population. This is for the United States. Uh, so we, we're 63 million now, 18% of the U.S. population. 63% are Mexican-American, uh, as I am, uh, from California. Uh, we have 10% uh, Puerto Ricans, and, and, and the rest are, are a lot of people, especially in our area here in D.C., from uh, Latin America. Uh, Central and South America, and also from the Caribbean. Uh, in terms of socioeconomic status, I think what's very important to know is that we're a very young population, median age of 29 uh, years old, which means that we have a lot of young families just starting their, you know, their careers, uh, buying their first houses, their first cars, what, what have you, and very, very, very much the backbone of the economy of the United States. Uh, this is the working group of, of uh, adults who are in our military, in our colleges, uh, and in our, uh, all of our businesses and agencies across the country. However, the majority are low income, live in crowded houses, have mixed families, which means many of us, my grandparents, for example, were all undocumented but mixed families uh, and uh, with limited English and uh, limited education and English proficiency and large families though. I have to say that that's the positive asset of our community. And when you think about policies, as I often say, uh, it's not about individuals, it's about the whole family. We need to make sure that when we think about law and policy and healthcare, the, the, whole, po the whole family comes to the doctor's office. So anyway, at healthcare, we have the greatest percentage that are not insured in this country. That means it's high cost of care uh, to our families and most families don't do without. Limited doctor visits and the health literacy is a major issue. And on the other hand, we have a lot of people that have certain diseases or conditions just because of the nature of their lifestyle, uh, obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. We're also underrepresented in all the health professions, as in law and other professions, in medicine and in public health. And we are also very underrepresented in clinical trials and research. This becomes very important when we talk about what to do about having community-based programs that reach our community. Well, they don't because we, we're not there managing them. Occupations, we're in small businesses, retail, grocery stores, construction, gardeners, janitors, farm workers, you name it. We are people that have hard work ethic uh, with, and because of the jobs, limited social distancing and, and many in our communities are the essential workers that have been hit the hardest by COVID-19. And we have lack of paid sick leave, and many, especially in the large cities, rely on public transportation because they don't own a car. 
COVID-19 in Latinos versus non-Latinos or non-Hispanics in the United States have two times the cases of COVID, five times the hospitalizations, and uh, sorry, two times the deaths. But, but I, what's important to know is, is probably about 50% of the states or less are even having data that we can use on racial ethnic data. Next slide. So before COVID, some other socioeconomic statistics, Hispanic businesses were growing at 34% in the country, the business owners that were Hispanic versus 1% of the non-Hispanic white. We have very strong, again, very strong work ethic in our communities. Greater than 60% of the Latinos are, were trying to become homeowners. And the bachelor's degrees in our, in our communities doubled in the last two decades. So you can see there was an, a, a very strong increase in the economic uh, picture that was cut, cut back by, by COVID-19. The medium income of, of our families is only 51,000 versus 71,000. I'm sorry, not of families, but individuals. Median income for Latinos in this country. You can say it's, it's, it's less than the uh, average and greater than one in three in our communities have had food insecurity, which means they don't have good fresh vegetables and fruits, or they, they can't afford uh, you know, to go out to eat. Food insecurity, just not having enough food, uh, or the wrong food, which is the cause of obesity. Unemployment uh, was 4% in February among Hispanics that rose to 19% in April, and then went down to 10% where it is now. But this rate is more than what happened in 2008 with a great recession. Next slide. So about COVID-19, it is a very new or novel virus that is more lethal than other viruses. And it is a respiratory uh, virus that has also a fomite spread, which means touch. You can get it from touching doorknobs, from touching services where you leave your groceries. And it also is an aeros aerosolization and droplets. It stays in the air, it floats in the air like balloons, as well as droplets when you speak or you cough, you pass it from one person to another. So uh, asymptomatic infections happen Lack of, we have lack of treatment and vaccines. And then some of the major problems, the more serious problems are the clotting. We have people that are getting clots and strokes in their, in their head, uh, clotting and having heart attacks in their, you know, in their hearts, uh, kidney problems. And then, and then we have the, the heart, the high blood pressure and cardiac problems, neurological problems, GI, meaning uh, you know diarrhea or other GI symptoms, and also just fatigue or mus your muscles hurt like the flu. Uh, you know the misdiagnosis is very common. A lot of people uh, were told when the virus started to stay home until you're short of breath, and then doctors found out that uh, that was a horrible mistake because by the time you're short of breath, with all these other problems happening. You, you end up dying if you're an older person uh, or, or uh, if you have underlying uh, diseases already like asthma. Next slide. The, the other issue for all Latinos and others is the behavioral problems. Because of social distancing, people have been isolated. Uh, elderly in our, in our families are always used to having their families around and being isolated because the young people didn't want to or have not wanted to get their parents or their grandparents sick. Uh, then there's a lot of misinformation and poor public health messages. People were told, don't go to the hospital you don't, until you're short of breath, right? Don't, don't do this, don't do that. Don't wear a mask and then wear a mask. So, you know, a lot of, lot of issues in this country. Delay in seeking care. Be, be, uh, again, um, our community is working two jobs. Uh, you know, taking care of large families, lots of other issues, and we all have the problem of not taking care of ourselves. 
lack of access to primary care, fear of the hospital, fear of cost, not having insurance, and fear of authorities and suspicious and, and having a lot more anxiety than, than before COVID-19. This year has been horrible for our communities. Next slide. So some of the strategies that are really needed and have been uh, put into legislation include education and outreach, social distancing and masks, have, especially for the essential workers, especially because we have multi-generations living in our homes and of course for our elders. And testing and vaccines needs to happen in our communities. We, we, are, we are actively fighting for those kinds of things to happen because our communities are the worst off. And major support is needed for new jobs because of all the unemployment. Next slide. Uh, it, so some of the recommendations, uh, it, again, uh, just mentioning a few, the government really needs to have more economic relief for small businesses and families, and especially new job training. I think the job training of the future is going to be healthcare. I think people realize how important public health having public health people working uh, to go test people, contact tracing, those are new jobs because of COVID-19. Uh, also healthcare industry, we need more people in our hospitals and our nursing homes that talk Spanish, that can be bilingual workers, uh, that can be nurses. And um, I, I think, and the health industry in the United States is very big and booming and large and growing. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll just say that I, we also have to support our providers. Those uh, we need more and better um, benefits under Medicare, which is uh, insurance for the older 65. Uh, and also for Medicaid right now, there's emergency Medicaid laws that need to continue to have more eligible people under Medicaid uh, for PPE and for licensing. Uh, and then the public charge issue for our community which was created by this administration for the first time to, to include health care and housing, uh, food stamps, uh, a horrible law uh, that was put in place in February, just before COVID happened. So they stopped it. It's not enforced because of COVID, but we think it should not be at all. Uh, public charge means that if you are an immigrant coming in this country and the authorities there at the border think that you're going to be a public charge. You're gonna be on, on, on federal assistance uh, that you shouldn't be allowed into the country. I mean, even if you're a good standing uh, you know, person. So anyway, and then our detention centers are horrible. Our prisons are horrible. I mean, these are the problems that need to be changed from government for, uh, to lessen COVID uh, culture and language. The health industry needs to be more affordable. That's the main issue, main message. Our healthcare systems need to have better referrals and follow-up of all patients, more Latinos in training to become doctors and nurses and dentists, more Latinos to have to be involved in research so we can have more data on strategies and solutions that matter for our families. And our communities, all of our communities need to be involved with, uh, with COVID education, media, churches, our senior centers, nonprofits especially. Ne next slide. And uh, so some of the, just a few things that we've done as an organization, the National Hispanic Medical Association, we have been invited to, to sit on committees at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the Vaccine Consultation Committee, uh, the Office of Minority Health. Uh, they have their own minority uh, programs. And NIH, the National Institutes of Health, has their own research and community engagement committee and also we have an MOU with FDA with our Alliance of Multicultural Physicians. We don't call ourselves minority, we say we're multicultural. And that is the Black Doctors and National Medical Association, the Native American Doctors, the Association of American Indian Physicians, the Asian Doctors is the National Council of Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Physicians. And then ABC is the Association of Black cardiologists and image me. Next slide. So just a few of the coalitions type work that we've done. We focus on legislation. Uh, we've been sharing strategies through webinars and media. 
Uh, we, we've been involved with testing and diagnostics. And then there's clinical trials for vaccines. All of these, these are partners. Um, it's, we've been involved in their committees. And then the vac vaccine distribution plan just got announced last week by the National Academies of Science and Medicine. The first people that will get the vaccines, if uh, assuming we have a safe vaccine by the end of the year, in the beginning of next year, it'll go to the healthcare workers and essential workers. So many in our communities, we need to let them know how important it is to get the vaccine. What we do now is we have a flu vaccine campaign, hoping more Latinos hear the message that it's important to get a vaccine for a virus so that you can save, you know, protect your family from having more people transmitting the, the virus. Uh, and we've had our own monthly briefings on COVID-19 since May uh, and we in congressional briefing in July. And, and this month, September and October, we have chapters. We have 17 chapters around the country having speakers addressing COVID-19 and talking about policies that uh, doctors need to know about. The next slide, uh, the federal advocacy. These are, and I'll just read the bottom here. These are some of the new bills that have been introduced this year that we've been a part of, that we've helped to explain. For example, that bias and anti-racism training needs to happen more in our, in our country, especially in the healthcare system. The Health Disparities Action Act uh, is uh, you know, looking at how we have more funding and the Racial Ethnic Disparities Task Force from CDC to have more data. And the last one is to have a special report on the community programs in communities across the country on what they're doing, best practices to look at the social determinants of health, your housing, your transportation, food, not just healthcare. And next slide, I think this is the last. Next slide. And this is the last slide. This is just our, our conference uh, in 2019. We have a national conference here in Washington, DC every year. We bring about uh, four or 500 people. This was just some of the doctors who went to visit Capitol Hill, visit, uh, Capitol Hill uh, offices, our congressmen and senators. Uh, and, and then this is a group of our partners, our corporate advisory board. Uh, and the last slide just has the NHMA logo, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. This is our chapter policy forums. Uh, and uh, if you go to our website, again, nhmamd.org, you'll see this list. And these are happening up until next week uh, about COVID uh, from our speakers from different cities around the country. We have 17 chapters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rios. This is. Uh very troubling and so important that we really are aware of these statistics of this information and I think that you are totally right that we need to have more of these conversations in every community that we are part of. Um, we're going to continue with Professor Daniel Lopez Ceballos. Um, he's an Associate Professor of Latinx Studies, Ethnic Studies and Health, Health Equity and Assistance Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education at Oregon State University. Uh, for well over a decade, he has worked towards addressing health equity issues, primarily among Latinx immigrant populations in the United States. His research and evaluation work focuses on the intersections of race, ethnicity, gender, class, and other socioeconomic and sociocultural factors, and their relationship to health and healthcare issues. He is invested in developing and implementing community, institutional, and policy level strategies to improve the health and well being of Latinx and other marginalized communities committed to civic engagement. Professor uh, Lopez Ceballos has been involved with a number of community-based organizations, including the Oregon Latino Health Coalition, Upstream Public Health, Casa Latinos Unidos, and the Corvallis Public School Foundation. He currently serves in the Oregon Commission of Hispanic Affairs, appointed by the governor of Oregon, and he earned his PhD in public health with concentrations in international health and health policy at Oregon State University, and MPH and BS degrees from the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador. 
thank you very much, Professor Lopez Ceballos, for uh, being here. And I think that you also have a uh, presentation. You can share your screen. Thank you very much, Professor Saez, for the invitation and the kind introduction. And um, I'm very glad to be here and sharing this, uh, this time with it and my fellow distinguished panelists. Um, so let me um, share my screen and um, to, uh, to add to um, uh, Dr. Rios's presentation, I wanna point out a few, uh, a few more, uh, I think considerations that we need to keep in mind in thinking about the, the um, disproportionate um, impact of COVID-19 among Latinos in the United States. The first thing I want is, 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 is uh, provide a framework for how, how I, uh, I would approach, and, and Dr. Rios spoke to this um, issue uh, as well, is in that, um, that we need to be thinking about um, uh, higher levels, if you will, of um, um, systems, policies, um, uh, social and physical environments that will lead to uh, excess um, illness, excess death. And certainly we see in the case of COVID, but it's not, you know, it, it is symptomatic of a larger issue. Um, and so um, it has exacerbated, uh, what would we could say pre-existing conditions uh, of, uh, policies and programs, for example, that have this that, that have a heavier burden on communities of color and uh, put uh, place uh, communities of color at a disadvantage. And so this uh, is manifested in social inequities, uh, on issues around class, race, ethnicity, of course, as we were talking about that, but also gender, immigration, status, sexual orientation. Um, I think at the, uh, Part you know that that those intersections I think are also important to to keep in mind as we analyze this uh, what COVID nineteen is showing us uh, and that disproportionate impact. Um, unfortunately, the data and Dr. Rhee has also alluded to this is that you know the data as we currently have there are major gaps and although there have been calls for a more comprehensive uh, picture of 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 the communities impacted by COVID nineteen, we have bits and pieces, but not a fully comprehensive picture, uh, particularly around these inter intersections, for example, of race, uh, ethnicity, gender, and class. Um, we certainly uh, need to uh, uh, think about um, uh, the, the issues around systemic racism, both historical and contemporary. We've had, uh, not too long after COVID-19, uh, hit us uh, a wave of uh, racial justice uh, protests across the country. And so this is important, I think, it, again, to be thinking about these uh, more multi-level um, uh, issues that will impact uh, the, the way we see that disproportionate outcomes for um, Latinx and other uh, communities of color. So certainly there, there are policies, practices, norms, that are structured in a way that uh, provide opportunity for disadvantage entire communities, regardless of individual behaviors. You know, we talk a lot about when we think about COVID-19 and prevention, about washing hands and maintaining physical distance, um, uh, wearing uh, a mask. Um, but there are larger issues uh, where a larger context in which these individual behaviors uh, take place. Um, just as an example, um, uh, in the case of uh, uh, a, um, a policy from the 60s, but that continues to reverberate today, that continues to have effects today, uh, redlining, and so entire neighborhoods, families, communities, uh, disadvantaged and continue to be impacted by that policy. Uh, another point I want to make, too, to stress the importance of looking at more community institutional policy level issues is uh, issues around culture and how that is understood. That if we focus around, for example, uh, how we look at uh, culture or acculturation, mostly through a language lens, we miss um, how uh, it's specifically to the Latino Latinx community, how um, uh, the living in low resource communities, low socioeconomic position, 
how those cultural identities are socially constructed and then institutional patterns of unequal treatment, those all contribute to disproportionate outcomes. Uh, so it's not, it's not just about the language, but there are other issues, uh, systemic, systematic issues to consider. Uh, Dr. Rios mentioned already about the population in the U.S. So let me skip this um, because you have that. What I think what I would mention is uh, particularly thinking about the foreign-born population. Um, it's important to know, uh, certainly in terms of uh, welfare policy, to uh, r remember that you know there, yes we have about uh, over 60 million Latinos living in the United States, about 18% of the U.S. population. Only about 13% is a foreign born population overall, about half of them from Latin America. What that means is that two thirds of Latinos in the United States are US citizens with all uh, the, um, at least in theory, the, the possibility of accessing services provided by uh, federal and state and local governments. Um, and uh, let me take it back to where, where um, many of you are today um, in uh, Washington, D.C. So the population, the Latino population decreases to about 11 percent uh, and 42 percent among the foreign born. Uh, but there are other groups as well to be thinking about. When we think about Latino immigrant populations in particular, you see that the slightly different picture of what we see the Latino population in the U.S. overall. Dr. Rios mentioned, uh, you know, a majority of the, the Latino population in the U.S. Uh, is a, a Mexican American or traces the roots back to Mexico, um, but we see in the case of the U, uh, of, of Washington D.C., for example, that the, the uh, uh, a majority of the Latino immigrant population in D.C. comes from El Salvador. Uh, Daniel, wanted to point. Daniel, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I I don't think think that your slides are moving, and so I just wanted oh. to point it out to you okay. that we are only seeing the, the first slide. Oh bring your shared window to the front. Let me see. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure how that you can do that. I'm seeing the, um, I'm seeing this light so you can yeah. see this. Right? Now we can see it. I think that okay. you, it, yes. So okay. we don't see, we, we are seeing the, the, the big slide and then the slides in the, in the left sidebar. Uh -huh. um, but we are seeing now, now it's moving. I think that you just have to click in each one. I don't know what's going on there, but. Okay, so can you see this? Uh, can you see the one I'm, I'm, I'm referring to then in, in DC? Okay, L yeah. and let me know. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Can you see the me moving that? Uh, the yeah, slides or no? Latino immigrants in DC, that's the one? Yeah, that's, uh, it is there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the issue is here. Uh, let me see. Um, you can see the, um, you can see the slides here. Let me see. Um, uh, I think that apologies. you are sharing your screen now. Yeah, let me, um, there is one thing here. Okay, share. There. there, you can see that, right? Eligibility for ACA? Yeah, yes. okay. Let me try these at least uh, while um, I know that we are uh, pressed on time, but um, hopefully you can see this. Then what I wanted to point out here uh, in, the, in the Latino immigrant population in the DC area in particular is that uh, the most common source of insurance for Latino immigrants was private insurance. And I think one of the things that we need to think about even within the US and a pending task for us is uh, how uh, private health insurance is tied to employment. And we, when we've had such large numbers of, of people, both in Latinx and other communities unemployed, um, uh, then uh, are left without any protection in the midst uh, of a healthcare protection in the midst of the pandemic. So a major barrier for accessing healthcare services. The, um, this is the uninsured population in the United States overall. And you can see that the that while there have been um, improvements in health insurance coverage for Latinos uh, following the ACA implementation, of course, that is being challenged in the courts right now, um, there's still a gap in, um, in the insurance rates. There's a good percentage, and this is by design, that um, the, about a third of um, uh, Latinos aren't eligible for coverage due to 
uh, restrictions uh, of the current law. So even uh, even that is um, a major issue here. Um, what uh, we see too for the uh, Latino population, and again, Dr. Rios alluded to this, is we have an overrepresentation in essential sectors of, both uh, of communities of color more broadly uh, and uh, black and Latino, Latinx worker more, more specifically. Um, and that uh, uh, understandably, uh, that population is concerned with uh, getting infected by COVID, uh, both, uh, and you can see uh, here in this graph, the, um, uh, for the Latinx Hispanic population, but also around um, requiring uh, hospitalization uh, for low income. So these, uh, when I mentioned earlier, the, these intersectionalities, these connections overlaps, you can see these are separated, but you could understand, you could see the connections right between race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status here, and how those will impact uh, our population. Uh, then it, it is not surprising this context then that there is an overrepresentation in the number of cases, and I'll give you three examples there. I mean Oregon, uh, where 13 percent of the population is Latino, and yet uh, almost 40 percent uh, of the cases are among Hispanic Latino uh, Oregonians. Uh, and representation in this as well, and Dr. Rios alluded to this. This is a survey by Latino Decisions earlier um, uh, this year in May that um, asked uh, this uh, representative sample of U.S. households, uh, U.S. Latino households, uh, about um, knowing somebody that is infected and one in four knew somebody that is infected by, by um, COVID. And um, uh, and this is something I was involved in that the, uh, from a survey from a third party that found um, Latino homes reporting serious COVID-19 symptoms nearly twice as often as compared to non-Hispanic white households. Uh, we have seen then the, the erosion of employment and you know, even more critical uh, as uh, by design, uh, health insurance is tied to uh, employment and so the loss of employee providing insurance you can see here but uh, you know and the uh, and the uh, tripping consequences of that job instability right and the the um, the, the the absence of uh, buffers uh, like savings that will carry households through this time uh, it is a it is an issue that impacts uh, Latino families uh, disproportionately and so certainly the, that, what that scenario causes in that, in, in that context is the, uh, the concerns about the financial challenges, about the educational impacts. Uh, you, you know, we have um, still to, we have yet to um, uh, figure out ways in which we can uh, reopen our schools safely. Certainly universities like ours have very limited in-person classes. Um, but K through 12 for the most part is not uh, bringing their students back to, um, to campus. So um, uh, to close, I wanted to mention, I think to bring back to uh, something, this is back in 2008 when the American Public Health Association put out a report uh, in order to, to tackling health inequities and to see, you know, I think it's an opportunity uh, as, as devastating as this uh, pandemic has been for the Latinx community is uh, to recommit to these larger issues. So we, even when we think about uh, you know, health and even access to healthcare services, that these seven uh, um, uh, recommendations, raising income, providing universal healthcare, you focus on prevention, increasing uh, representation in the health professions, uh, and, uh, increasing the number of community health workers and expanding the roles, reporting, monitoring, and uh, lastly, community-based participatory approaches for research and intervention. And I think this is one of the keys uh, of, of maintaining, preserving trust in the communities. There's, there's, there's uh, as you can uh, imagine, there's uh, widespread mistrust in fe federal agencies, in immigration agents at the local level, uh, as well what the, with, uh, what, what ICE has, been doing over the past few years. And so uh, all the more to recommit to working through community-based organizations. And uh, the figure to your right um, shows 
um, also or expands upon the specific um, issues to tackle uh, that comes from uh, our colleagues at Salud America, uh, issues around food security, poverty, uh, housing conditions and open space. The one thing I would mention about housing that I think is important to distinguish is that one is housing conditions, another is multi-generational households that has been that the living in multi-generational households have been shown to have uh, benefits and you know it's culturally relevant uh, for the Latinx community. Uh, the issue is about the housing conditions in which our families live and that needs to be resolved uh, in, in, in programming and in policy. And with that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop and I'm happy to come back to, with questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Robert Ceballos. You, um, um, I think it's very important what you have stressed in terms of the um, importance of structural racism and the conditions of poverty that you've mentioned as part of, of the problem. Uh, we are going to now move, and, and at the end of the presentations, we'll have a, a, enough time, I hope, for a good conversation and uh, for questions and answers. Um, we're going to move now to the more global picture of what's going on with uh, Latin America and, and with, uh, with, with the global, with the effects of, of the pandemics in, in a global scale. Um, so we are going to hear from Professor Juan Pablo Gutierrez. Um, he's a professor at the Center for Policy, Population and Health Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and uh, UNAM, and the chair of the Technical Committee of the Morelos Commission on Evaluation of Social Development and member of the Global Alliance for Vaccination Evaluation Advisory Committee. His research focuses on comprehensive evaluation of social programs and policies universal health coverage and effective access, and social inequities in health. He's a member of the National Observatory on Health Inequalities in Mexico. And um, Dr. Gutierrez has been responsible for the evaluation of social and health programs in Mexico, Ecuador, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Honduras, and India, as well as several population-based health surveys, both in households and facilities. He's uh, has authored or co-authored more than 70 papers in peer-reviewed journals. Um, so I don't think that we have a, any uh, person more expert to talk about this than Professor Juan Pablo Gutierrez. Thank you. And I think that you also have a presentation. Oh, you already have yeah. You're all prepared. Thank you. There, thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you uh, sharing uh, this conversation. Many thanks, uh, Professor Osiris, for the for the invitation. And also, it's uh, really interesting uh, uh, to hear before from Dr. Rios and, and Professor Lopez Ceballos. I think that um, uh, without uh, discussing that before, we are kind of aligned in the, in the same uh, overall idea of what we are uh, discussing today. And, and I think that's uh, very. It's, it's this inequality thing is very rooted in, in, in most of the issues that uh, we are we are discussing. Um, for for this presentation, um, I'm I'm going to use some some data from the from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, also uh, some data from a report that was produced by the Pan American Health Organization and the Economic Commission for Latin America (ECLAC) on the health and the, and the economy and, and the COVID time, as well as some data from the OCB report on, on the economic outlook for the region. So just to acknowledge that I'm, I'm kind of uh, bringing those data to, to this presentation. Um, so what I want, I want to discuss is uh, with you is uh, uh, how social inequity, inequity is a key driver for the COVID-19 pandemic and, and how this is, I think, particularly relevant for, for Latin America. Um, so I'm going to, to mention in, in a few slides the, the level of inequality in the region in Latin, America, in Latin America is the highest in the world. So that's a, a kind of issue. So the, the main message uh, uh, for, from this presentation is that the pandemic is exacerbating uh, as inequalities in, in the region as it arrives to, to, to the region in, in, in a moment that we were already facing the, the synergistic effect of a non-communicable disease pandemic. So that is 
as Dr. Rios mentioned, uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, but also uh, with a huge degree of social inequality. So uh, I'm not going to try to discuss how these pre-existing conditions are, are connected. Uh, I think that Dr. Lopez Ceballos also already mentioned that. But uh, argue, what I want to do is to argue that we need to rethink risk. So that is that we need kind of use precision public health in order to face the syndemic of COVID-19. And yes, I say uh, syndemic, and that's in, in the following sense. So there is this uh, concept of, of syndemic. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that uh, uh, right, but you can see the word there. So that's the thing. So this is a, a concept that, that proposed to label the, the synergistic effects or interaction of two or, or more coexistent uh, diseases or conditions that result in an in excess burden of disease. So in, in, the, in this approach, in this framework, there is an emphasis on the, on the situation and circumstances of the uh, individuals. And I think that's totally in, in the line of what uh, uh, Dr. Lopez just mentioned. And uh, in that sense, syndemic relies uh, very much fundamentally on, on, the, on the context. And what I want to, to argue is that uh, that's our current situation. So, um, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic in, in, in Latin America uh, can, can be, I think, better understood from this pandemic framework. So the COVID-19 pandemic has generated uh, uh, in this approach, in this way to present it, uh, uh, this kind of sort of perfect storm as uh, it's adding burden to an already existing pandemic, as I mentioned, of non-communicable disease. Uh, and that has been linked to these conditions, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, has been already linked to a uh, uh, worse prog prognosis for COVID-19. In addition, in Latin America, and I guess in other uh, several low and middle income countries, and as well in high income countries, as Dr. Rios already discussed it for the case of the states, we are facing this uh, challenge with a uh, weakened health systems. So we are ill equi equipped to respond to an extremely challenged condition, a new virus that uh, we are still trying to understand in terms of the transmission or, or, or its mechanisms to undermine individual's health. So the fact that we are facing a, a major public health crisis with an underfunded health system with a lack, lacking of, of uh, uh, health insurance, uh, uh, that's kind of uh, uh, worsening the, the entire situation. So this is uh, just a uh, quick review to show how badly the non-communicable non diseases are affecting population in, in Latin America. It's, it is the leading cause of morbidity, mortality, and disability in the region. And as you can see in, in, in this map, it's not a one country issue, but it's spread all over the region. And of course, some countries are more affected than others. And as I mentioned, this is happening in, 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 a, in a context of huge, huge inequality. So Latin America has been characterized as the most unequal region in the world. While there has been some progress in terms of income distribution, still there is an enormous difference uh, on life expectancy, for example, related to social conditions. So in this figure, as you can see, there are countries ranked in terms of the Human Development Index, and there is a four years uh, difference in life expectancy. And this difference is also happening within countries. So this is not an issue uh, between, but also within, within countries. And as I mentioned, we are uh, facing this with a, a, a weak, uh, already weakened health system. So there is a underfinanced, segmented, and fragmented. And this is a kind of a common characterization of health systems in, in, in the region. So public health, uh, public health expenditures, or expenditures, uh, public expenditures on health, that's a better way to say it. It's in average uh, well below the, the recommended uh, uh, 6%. And uh, that implies that out-of-pocket expenditures cover more than one third of uh, healthcare costs in the region and could be, as you can see in, in, in the graph uh, below, up to 60, uh, 65%. So on this level, 
uh, household expenditures in health are then encouragement, creating improvement, improvement household, increasing poverty, uh, or those households that are incurring in what, what is called catastrophic health expenditures. So um, the region has uh, now becoming the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what are, it seems that the first wave of the, of the pandemic has uh, is declining now. We are still seeing an increasing number of cases and deaths. And uh, the burden is being heavier for those living in poverty and for those living with pre-existing non-communicable disease uh, condition. And of course, it's worse for those in, in, in uh, having at the same time any non-communicable disease and also living in poverty. This is uh, what I'm referring before as the synergistic effect that we are, uh, that uh, when, when we talk about pandemic. So the, uh, this data from the Pan American Health Organization shows that the del, the death toll continues to, to increase. And as the influenza season is, is arriving, so they will increase our concern that this uh, other pandemic will add to this pandemic. So this is uh, uh, data from, from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation uh, showing the, the burden in, in terms of the de death per uh, 100,000 inhabitants in the different countries in the region. And the estimation that ha they have produced in terms of the total number of deaths projected by February 1st of the next year. So from being no existing in, in 2019, uh, the COVID-19 is already uh, among the top five causes of death in, in, in the countries in the region and may uh, well be the main cause of death in 2020 for some countries. And that's kind of the project, projection for, for, for Mexico. So we have uh, these red uh, health consequences in the sense of the increasing number of, of deaths. Uh, but there are, these are not the only ones health consequences. So there is a, also the response, response to the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, affected also the, the provision of health services for other conditions. So it's, it's uh, causing a, a disruption on, on, on healthcare in general. So, and this is generating an uh, excess mortality for other conditions that uh, we are just starting to, to quantify. But, uh, will be very relevant in, in general. So some estimations uh, uh, already produced suggest that uh, life expectancy could decrease in about uh, two or three years, two or three or three years uh, as a result of the, of the increased mortality that we are seeing in, in, in this year. And there are also uh, social consequences. Poverty is expected to increase in, in, in this uh, post-pandemic uh, Time, I mean, uh, and, 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 and an important uh, uh, magnitude. So we are talking about, uh, yes, 7% uh, percentage points, uh, but that implies uh, uh, 45 million people uh, uh, becoming poor in, in for, for the recession that this pandemic is, is, has been already caused in, in, in the region, but also in, in, in the world. Um, so how to fi face this pandemic? So uh, addressing this pandemic uh, requires uh, acknowledging that the, the role of social determinants of health. And, and I think that uh, Dr. Lopez uh discussed that very well. So uh, we need to, 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 to think on, on, on how to, to uh, make interventions that are, are, are directed to, to uh, uh, improving living conditions of the, of, the, of the population in general. And we also need to, uh, to, to increase uh, the, the, the use of the evidence so that implies recognizing the need for, for this uh, scientific approach to use uh, the knowledge that has been generated and is already in, in, in progress all over the world but we need to, to use evidence. And uh, that implies choosing an additional framework that I want to mention. I would like to mention that's the framework of uh, precision public health. What that implies, that implies uh, this, uh, uh, using 
and sharing uh, data to target risk reduction intervention to those that are more susceptible to worse outcomes. So individuals uh, living in poverty, individuals with uh, pre-existing conditions, uh, having a comprehensive approach to uh, generate syner synergies between non-communicable disease uh, programs and infectious disease programs. So uh, 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 a comprehensive approach in terms of the healthcare uh, response and uh, to provide to those socioeconomically vulnerable with the means to mitigate the effects of the response. So we need to continue to, with the social distancing intervention, the, the lockdowns in some cases, but we need to make sure that individuals have the means to, to uh, live through this, this uh, uh, crisis. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gutierrez. This is, again, um, troubling and at the same time, it's such a necessary conversation. And um, I think it's uh, great that there is synergies among uh, the three of you, uh, which also speaks to the situation that it's uh, very common uh, on what's going on. So I, I wanted to start um, with a few questions most of them are for the three of you. Um, but the first one, and I'm going to go start again from the local to, to, the, to the bigger picture. Um, I wanted to start with, with a question about what health inequities for Latinos has COVID-19 exposed in, in the United States specifically? Um, and then I guess the, the next question more globally is who are the Latinos in Latin America? In other words, what is, are the inequities that, um, that you see, um, Dr. Gutierrez, in Latin America, what are the, the groups that are hurt the most, you know? Uh, so that I think, it, and, and that's an invitation for the three of you to answer both, both parts of, of the question. Um, maybe we can start with Dr. Rios. We can go in the same order. Okay, sure. Uh, well, let, let me just say that uh, historically Latinos in the United States have had lots of inequities. So nothing new, but I think the rest of the country, you know, this country seems to know a little bit more about Blacks or African Americans, Black Latinos who are Black, right, uh, than Latinos. And I think we're just a very humble group of people that are not, uh, you know, raising our voices and demanding our rights. And as a consequence, our living conditions are among our families. We don't, you know, we have a lot of stigma when it comes to mental health or anxiety or problems. We get help from each other. We have our own community organizations that help each other. Um, our families help each other. I mean, I'm the oldest in my family and I can tell you I help all my brothers and sisters. My parents died in the last few years and I'm it. And I think that, I think that, so the inequities that have been opened up to the rest of the country seem new. Not having insurance, not having language services, not having Latino doctors, not having, but they're not new. And I just think that this country needs to wake up that one out of four Americans in the next 20 years, by 2042, will be of Latino descent. From all the cultures and, and the beautiful assets that we have, our cultural, our foods, our music, is we are America. And so for, if we want, if the country wants us, wants a healthy economy, wants a healthy people, they have to redirect funding to our cities, organizations, you know, stakeholders. Uh, and, and we have to work more closely with Latin America in learning from Latin America. And I'll just jump to the international. I think the best practices come from our culture, countries of origin, because they've been passed on through our grandparents and our parents, where they come from. It, we're very young, for those that are not generations of generations of generations in the United States. You know, Mexico is the United States up until 1848. So it's only been 150 years 
that the people living in Texas and California and Nevada were in Mexico. They were Mexico. This was Mexico. So anyway, uh, I'll just stop there. But I think we have to keep our traditional folk medicine, you know, and 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 uh, and blend it with uh, new opportunities, new programs. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lopez Ceballos. I would add to that. I'd second uh, what Dr. Rios mentioned, but I will also add to that that I think it's important about and the season, uh, right? As as we are getting. Uh, ready for uh, 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 an election, uh, November third. I think is also an you know that I think part of it is is the the, the issue of representation and uh, power uh, and uh, power imbalances. Right? That yes, we in mm -hmm. the United States the Latino population represents eighteen percent of the U.S. population overall, but that doesn't mean necessarily even that it is uh, you know at the same level represented. In local, state, uh, mm -hmm. federal government, uh, and um, the census uh, that is being closed uh, ahead of schedule um, by the most recent ruling of the Supreme Court is also, I think, an important. You know, it's so. And so I think certainly thinking at multiple levels and multiple layers of, of influence, but I, I think we do have to, uh, when thinking about the more upstream. Uh, uh, um, uh, initiatives that we can engage in. Certainly, I think it it is about the the uh, you know that the those the decision makers that we are that we as a community are at the table, not only at the table where decisions are being made, but also have decision making power, right? So we're not just uh, you know one we'll say one one voice in a, in a in a group of twenty that will you know how much will that carry. Uh, today, uh, and that um, that I think it's important to um, uh, I mentioned in my in my remarks about the you know community based efforts and community organizing. I think in this season in particular, uh, I've seen uh, being hopeful in spite of all the challenges of coalitions, uh, uh, either existing coalitions or new coalitions being built to engage. Uh, communities of color to engage Latinx communities to engage in the intersections. Dr. Rios alluded to Afro Latinx, for example. That's certainly an unfinished uh, business for us here and for us in Latin America. You know, we um, every time I see our men's soccer team play, to me, it's a reminder of the unfinished social uh, contract of an unfinished social contract. That's so that uh, that. Um, uh, a soccer team is primarily Afro-Ecuadorian, and yet the communities they come from continue to be uh, underserved, underrepresented. Um, and so I think, it, it, you know, uh, we, we have much uh, work to do. But like I said, I think at least what I see uh, in, in the United States in the lead up to this election cycle, that much uh, of that community and uh, um, uh, organizing is taking place, and I'm hopeful in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Gutierrez? Uh, uh, well, uh, thinking on the, on, the, on the second question that you mentioned, I think that uh, overall, so what I'm, I was saying is that uh, individuals living in poverty and those affected by non communicable diseases, but uh, because of the, of the structural inequities in, in, in the region, so those living in poverty are, in general, uh, on, on, on large proportion, individuals from uh, indigenous uh, uh, populations and, and individuals living in rural areas. So that's uh, the uh, 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 historically uh, underserved population that are being affected, not only because uh, uh, they are facing a higher risk for also non-communicable diseases because uh, lacking access to, to to, to uh, um, uh, I lost the word, but uh, comida saludable, so uh, healthy food, but also uh, because they are, uh, when, when they access health services, the quality of the health services uh, serving uh, population living in poverty are uh, low quality compared to, to other services. So they are kind of being affected by these uh, two, two, two ways, no? uh, increasing risk for, for conditions and also uh, having a low quality 
uh, services, health services. Thank you. See, I, I, I wanted to ask that because I think that we forget that within also our communities, there is also a layer of who are those who suffer the most. And uh, poverty is not a situation that affects everyone, but it tends to affect specific communities as well. So I think that COVID-19 has also left that uh, more in the open, right? Um, I, we have a question that says, what is the situation with COVID-19 and the camps for asylum seekers? So I don't know if uh, any one of you want to uh, say something about that. Um, I can mention uh, there, there is, a, I think it's a, an, it's a larger issue uh, in, in terms of, the, uh, of how the data, right, data transparency um, through the pandemic, uh, we know that the administration rerouted uh, hospital data <laughs> uh, from the CDC, right, into uh, a third party. And so, you know, I think we, we have an, uh, an issue with data transparency. And when it comes to immigrant detention centers um, in particular, in particular, so the little bit, there's, you know, there's been uh, certain uh, reports, but not full transparency in, in, to the extent to which, but the little bit, and um, um, a report that came out in, in June uh, with ICE data on their testing, uh, about 57%, uh, they had a 57% positivity, positivity rate. So the highest, you know, if, we, if that was a state, was the highest among, um, uh, among all the states uh, at the time, this is in June, Georgia was the, the next one uh, with a positivity rate about 26%, where the threshold, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the ideal is to be below the five, uh, below 5%. Um, and so it, it did dictate, you know, it gives us a sense of both the, the spread uh, on the population, but also the lack of the lack of testing, right? And not, not everybody is getting uh, has, having access to, to testing, and then what all that means: testing, tracing, um, uh, isolating, quarantining, uh, but also the you know the pre exist the, the conditions in which these in detention centers uh, to to begin with, um, I think pose for a for a very challenging environment, and we're. Um, and when we add um, the limited transparency uh, in how these immigrant detention centers, many uh, privately run, uh, I think pose for a, for a troubling scenario. Um, thank you. I, uh, since we were talking also about different um, groups that are impacted and uh, Dr. Rios, you mentioned in your slides also that one of the issues is that Latinos are not, are underrepresented in, in research trials. Mm -hmm. um, and that reminded me also of the issue of women being underrepresented always in, um, in, in medicine, but in research trials as well and everything. And I was wondering, what's the, how, what do we know about women and COVID-19 in general um, uh, in who are doing research? Well, uh, let me answer it in two, two answers. One is that many Latinas and women have had problems with pregnancies because of COVID-19 and clotting, especially in high blood pressure problems. Um, and in terms of women in research or minority women in research, Latinas in research, I think there's a little bit more, you know, role model and mentoring, um, leadership development for the academic pipeline, uh, you know, to, but, Latinos in general and African Americans in general are very few. For the United States, out of all the doctors, and these are MDs, DOs, doctors of osteopathy or, or MDs, we're only 5% of the doctors in the country. So here we are, 18% of the, you know, we're going to be 25% of the country, and we're only 5% of the doctors. And we pretty much have been flatlined since the 1970s. We went up a little bit and then went down. And in 1996, California and Texas both had major decisions made not to count race or ethnicity in higher education. Um, there's a Proposition 16 right now in California to do away with Proposition 209 so that we can look at race again in the admissions in California colleges. So that might help. But I think um, 
many, many more of our community's uh, college students go to college, uh, Latino students, but still get, you know, they get roped in by their families to go work and help the family and they don't continue on. And to be a doctor or to be a researcher, to be an academic faculty like yourselves, I mean, you have to stay and invest your time and energy for, a long, for the long haul. And um, our families don't realize that it's an investment because when you get out, you not only help your families, but you help develop knowledge for the country to develop better data and need for data uh, like for things like COVID-19 and the impact of our communities. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. So my, my, my sense is that, um, uh, I mean, in general, the, 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 the risk for, for getting uh, infection and, and, and the, the probability of uh, a severe condition is uh, lower for, for women compared to men. No? So that's, uh, but the, in, in the other hand, and that's the part of the of the kind of the of the relation to risk to the to the to the COVID nineteen. But in the other hand, uh, uh, at least in the region in general, and, and assume will be the same with the uh, Latino community in the states, uh, because of of women uh, uh, having uh, this uh, more this traditional role of uh, uh, providing care for people at, at, at the household and, and that. I mean, what I want to say to that is, for example, uh, is still in, in Mexico, we are still uh, with the schools uh, closures. No? So there is a uh, teaching online. So that implies that uh, my, my, my daughters are staying at home to, to take uh, classes, but in several of, of, of uh, uh, families in, 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 the, in, in the country, so woman has to do their uh, 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 their 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 work, but at the same time taking care of the of the kids staying at home, and and, and that's uh, increasing the already uh, heavy burden for for women. So that's I think the the, the main uh, gender issue related to to the pandemic. That's uh, exacerbating that that uh, uh, increasing burden for for women. Thank you. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with that uh, assessment uh, of, of yours, Dr. Gutierrez. And I think that that's one of the m main issues that we've had. I mean, in, in addition to um, women faring badly, probably in, in different contexts, um, the issue of, of this blurring between public and private spheres have also left very apparent the fallacy of the public and private divide in general, right? So um, I, I have a, a question and, and we have very few minutes left, but I wanted, and, and uh, all of you did mention something about the number of deaths per 100,000. And, but I, I wanted to, to, to go back to this statistic and um, I was looking today uh, at uh, the countries that are doing worse on, in, on numbers of, of, of death per 100,000. And the list that I have here, uh, which is uh, very similar to probably the, the list that you, you have as well, um, uh, has like Peru number second, and then Belgium, Andorra, Bolivia, Spain, Ecuador, Chile, Brazil, Mexico, and the United States, and then the UK. And I was wondering if, if you can, I mean, even if, if you're not expert on the specifics of these healthcare systems, what is it that these countries have in common that have done so poorly? Because when, when I, as a, uh, as a lawyer, ignorant totally of statistics and everything, <laughs> mostly everything, um, I, it's very difficult to understand just by looking at this, what is it that these countries have done or have not done that puts them all together, countries that are small and large, poor and rich, uh, countries with um, only private health care and countries with, with public health care. What is it that you think that makes the, the countries that have done so poorly uh, in, in this pandemic by looking at the number of deaths? I mean, as uh, I mentioned, I think that's related to uh, 
social inequality and um, the, the pre-existing pandemic and non-communicable diseases. No? So I think that the, the issue is that uh, when the COVID-19 arrived, uh, we were already facing this uh, huge challenge of, of trying to deal uh, with, the, with the increased number of, uh, of uh, prevalence of obesity, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and, and, and uh, that are, are not equally distributed. No? So they're affecting uh, most of, uh, most uh, with, a, with a larger share, with a larger share to, to, the, to the individuals living in poverty. But also, I mean, what, what, th what one thing that this uh, whole system show is that uh, they were already on a crisis. No? I mean, they were already underfunded. So we are we are trying to to deal with uh, with, with with a new new challenge when we were already uh, having uh, uh, several troubles trying to to provide healthcare to the to the population. So uh, uh, what happened that the countries uh, didn't uh, invest on, 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 on building a strong health systems, and now we are paying for that. I would add to um, uh, the, um, and I, I can post the link on the chat, the Brookings Institution uh, look at um, uh, a comparative report. I think when it, when it comes to the US, I think it, a fair comparison, uh, you know, among uh, um, high income countries, right? And so the Brookings looked at uh, other, uh, the US with other OEC, uh, OECD countries. So a more clear comparison. I think one of the, one of the things, you know, is, is in, uh, and, uh, and Professor Gutierrez mentioned to these, you know, in terms of social inequality, right? And the more unequal society, the more, you know, the more vulnerabilities uh, that that will expose. Um, certainly we, you know, among uh, high, income, high income countries were pretty much the only country that doesn't have some form of, uni of a universal healthcare system. So that certainly puts uh, communities at a disadvantage. We tie a health insurance to employment and with high unemployment rates, that you know that's certainly um, uh, that's certainly uh, the case. Uh, to, to put the unemployment rate in context, for example, uh, between G January and July, ac according to Brookings, uh, the um, uh, un um, unemployment rate uh, in other OECD countries was 1.22. In the U.S., uh, overall was about uh, 7%. And Dr. Rios mentioned the unemployment rate among Latinos is close to 10% now uh and and so that you know that i i think uh when we see uh other uh comparisons to other countries i think we have to be cautious about the 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 you know how these countries came into this pandemic or syndemic as, as dr Rutier has mentioned that would that would that would then play out in in such different uh, different ways, uh, and you know, in the case of the U.S., frankly, is the ways that that the, it has been handled. Right, it is clearly that leadership um, at the uh, at various levels and uh, at the national level as well uh, have played a significant role in how in uh, how uh, the pandemic has been um, confronted. Uh, so we, we definitely have work to do in that area. So, well, in, in, in with that, and, and we only have just a couple of minutes, so very quickly, um, how, what strategies can we have to um, improve access to healthcare? What, what, the, what those strategies should be to improve access to healthcare? Uh, Dr. Rios? To improve the healthcare in general or? Access, access to healthcare. Access, access to healthcare. Well, I think that uh, this country needs to have better data uh, so we're talking about the Latino population. We need better data on the Latino population, better research. Uh, we need, uh, and, and we're very much regionalized and different populations. So there's Dominicans and Cubans and Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. We need to have the subpopulation data. We need to include them in, in, in the clinical research, the clinical trials, uh, so that we can better understand strategies that are directed to the communities. And, and I think that the federal government needs to work better with the public health organization. There really does need to be a better public health organization in the country. 
you know, it, they downsized, the government's downsized, um, I think after President Reagan or during President Reagan's time and it never went back because they decided let's not have services, let's not have healthcare for everybody, healthcare delivery, let's just have a surveillance of infectious disease when we have all these needs for, you know, places to exercise for obesity, better nutrition, all these other things that we need in our communities um, are the strategies that we really need to, to turn around the, the um, you know, the non-communicable diseases uh, in the United States and everywhere else. And I do think that we do need leadership from our communities to take care of our communities. The community health center programs in this country were started in the 1960s to help take care of poor communities. So that, and there's, there's migrant, and there's you know, urban, rural, community health centers and the boards of directors have to be from the community, not just you know, the, uh, the white men that are in medicine, right? Um, and, I'm, and that's still true, that all the hospitals in our country are led by white males. And um, so we need to change that drastically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Gutierrez and Dr. Ceballos, uh, Lopez Ceballos, I don't know if, if uh, final words before we close. Yeah, I think that I totally agree with uh, what Dr. Rios say, and I think that's, uh, I mean, that means we need, what we need to, to increase access, we need the universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. If we need to do that, we need a single payer model that everybody has access to health services, regardless of their, of their income, their condition, their, their, their origin. So that, I think that's uh, the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, would, I would only add to that to take that same principle to other um, social protections. Uh, so not, ju not, not only um, um, in, in, in health care specifically, but also other, um, other support systems uh, so that we are better prepared the next time that, um, that uh, uh, something like this pandemic uh, hits us. So uh, with this, we are uh, running out of time. So I'm just going to thank you so much for allowing us to have uh, this uh, much broader conversation. And the depending message maybe that uh, it was there is what are for our law students, for example, how I hope that this panel inspired them to take action, to understand that we have to uh, form better professionals in our communities that will really work for our communities. And when I say our communities, I really say um, around the world. And uh, as I said, in Latin America, we have our own uh, problems as well in terms of who the Latinos are, right? And so um, I want to thank you again for taking the time to be here with us today. And with this, we close this panel and we move to the award ceremony. Um, so with this, I finish and I have to admit that I don't know how I have to finish in terms of the technicalities of this. And uh, so I'm just going to stop here and wait for somebody magically appear and tell us <laughs> if we can just leave <laughs> or, or how we go to the other to How do we move to the award ceremony? Well, thank you. Thank you. And take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yes. Gracias. Muchas gracias a ustedes. So I see Dina. So I will I will leave now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful panel. Um, I'm co-hosting today. Welcome with Lisa, Lisa Taylor. And I'd like to introduce Lucero for the moderation of our conversation with our keynote speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lucero Ortiz. I'm a proud graduate of the American University Washington College of Law. Um, we are actually going to start with our award ceremony. Um, so Dina Navar, who is the uh, chair of the Latino Latina Alumni Association for the Washington College of Law, uh, also known as LAW, and Lisa Taylor, who's our associate dean for Affinity Programs, Diversity and Inclusion, will be our masters of ceremony for this awards um, program. So I'll turn it back to Dina and Lisa. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Lucero. 
Thank you and welcome and welcome back uh, to everyone joining us this afternoon for the 22nd Annual Hispanic Law Conference and Awards Ceremony. And we will have our keynote address after our awards ceremony. Uh, my name is Lisa Sonia Taylor. I am the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at Washington uh, College of Law. Together with Dina Navarre, we will serve as your Masters of Ceremony for tonight. Uh, we uh, cannot have presented this successful event without a committed group of people uh, particularly Denise Richard, Courtney Watson, uh, Ryan uh, C. Uh, at American University, Washington Co College of Law, and all our co-sponsors, the Hispanic Bar Association for the District of Columbia, uh, particularly its president, Ruben Reyna, and the executive board of LALSA, which is our Latin American Law Students Association, and law, which is our Latino Latina Alumni Association of the Washington College of Law. I'll turn it over to Dina. Thank you. I was a little too excited. I'm, I was <laughs> wanting to buy, pass the awards and get to the keynote speaker. I've been so excited to hear from uh, Ms. Dolores Huerta. So I'll, I'll have to wait a little bit longer and practice patience. But bienvenidos a todos. Buenas tardes, pura vida. My name is Dina Navar. I am the chair of the Latina Latino Alumni Association of the Washington College of Law. It's been a privilege to serve alongside the rest of the committee members who have put this wonderful event together for the 22nd Annual Hispanic Law Conference. And once again, welcome to this award ceremony. We are very excited. And we are welcome, we are very honored to welcome all our recipients virtually. So without any further ado, let's get started. You can find the full biography of all our award recipients in your conference program, which is emailed to you upon your registration. But our first award recipient is William E. Chavez. He is a recipi recipient of the Premio Inspiracion. This award was established in 2007 and it is awarded annually to a Juris Doctor student who has demonstrated an exceptional commitment to the Latino Latina community nationally or internationally. William E. Chavez is, gra is a graduating JD student and has served as a Senator of the Student Bar Association, the SBA. He is also a member of the Latin American Law Students Association, LALSA, and he serves on their executive board. And he's also the president of ADVANCE, which is a mentoring initiative for first-generation WCL students. He is a native of San Fernando, California. And I, I'm proud to say that he is from Southern California. I am here in Los Angeles. So I love that Californians are far, um, are far and um, in DC. But anyways, he's a native of San Fernando, California, and he is a proud son of Salvadorian immigrants. He has mentored a middle school student through the Latin American Youth Center, LAYC, and he is also uh, a Latinx student at WCL. William grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and he is a graduate of the University of Maryland College Park. Please help me welcome William. Congratulations, William, on this award. Thank you, muchas gracias. Um, well, first, I, I want to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the members of the Hispanic Law Conference Planning Committee, the Hispanic Bar Association of the District of Columbia, the Latino Latina Alumni Association of the Washington College of Law, and then last but not least, the Latinx Law Student Association of the Washington College of Law. When I uh, first learned about being selected to receive Premio Inspiracion, I began to think about the people in my life who have inspired me to pursue my goals and people who have inspired me to uh, feel genuinely passionate about service to others. And upon reflect, reflecting, I found that I'm constantly inspired by genuine acts of kindness and genuine acts of service. Um, I'm inspired by people who face tremendous adversity, who haven't had the same privileges in life as others, but somehow still manage to find a way to give back to their communities and fight to make a world, the world a better place, not just for themselves, but for others and for, the, and for those who come after. Uh, that being said, I recognize that I'm surrounded by inspiring people at WCL and in the greater Latinx community here in the DMV. 
Um, we are facing an unprecedented pandemic that disproportionately affects the Latinx community, um, even here in the DMV. Uh, so many people from our communities here uh, don't have the privilege of working from home, don't have access to health care, have to risk their lives in order to find some kind of way to pay for rent, to pay for school, to pay for food, and all in the middle of a devastated economy. But even in the middle of this tremendous adversity, uh, there are people that step up to support one another. Take, for example, the community of Langley Park, Maryland, which is a predominantly Latinx and predominantly immigrant community um, here in Maryland, no, no, no further than like 20 minutes away from the Washington College of Law. When the pandemic hit, um, students from Langley Park and the surrounding communities of College Park, Maryland, Hyattsville, um, they got together and they formed a collective that's called Audelia's Community Response Team. And since March and since the beginning of this, this pandemic, these students and their families have worked tirelessly collecting donations to feed hundreds of families, provide clothes, school supplies. They've even found housing for homeless youth. And they've even set up um, free COVID-19 testing. And they even did a census caravan to get to make sure that the community is counted on, on the 2020 census. For me, when I see an effort like that, a, a, the Audelia uh, community response team is truly inspiring. And I wanna encourage everyone to support their mission and to do what you can to support the predominantly Latinx and American communities here in the DMV, in Langley Park, in Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights, and in the regions in Virginia. Um, next, here at WCL, our Latinx professors and our alumni have also supported Latinx students. And alumni have even offered to help students with financial support uh, to get through this extremely difficult time. And I'm inspired by you. To my parents, William Salvador Chavez and Angelica Maria Cabrera, muchísimas gracias. Um, I'm constantly inspired by the sacrifices that they've made um, all these years that allow me to be where I am today. I wanna thank my partner, Madeline, who has inspired me from the very start to you know, work really hard to pursue my dreams and be the best person that I can be. To my sisters, Angie and Alma, thank you for everything. I love you. <laughs> uh, finally, I wanna thank my community of friends at WCL. I, I can say without a doubt, you've been the best part of being in law school, of this law school journey. Um, Alicia Hogan Miller, Anna Avalos, Andrea, Andrea Rivers, Christopher Weeks, Dana Busgang, Alex Garcia, and so many other people, Dennis Stinchcomb, uh, you all inspire me. Uh, thank you for your support. And I, I know that you're gonna be phenomenal lawyers and advocates, and I can't wait to see what you accomplish. Lastly, I'm tremendously proud of the members of LALSA who have been working extremely hard on this conference. Um, you've done an incredible job. And thank you to the faculty, the staff, Dean Taylor, um, Lucero, thank you so much. You know, I feel very honored and I feel very blessed to receive this award today. And I will make sure to keep paying it forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. Congratulations. And as the chair of the Latina Latino Alumni Association of the Washington College of Law, it is my privilege to introduce the recipient of the Edward Bow Alumni Award, Corey Alonzo Yoder. Established in 2007, this award recognizes a WCL graduate with demonstrated commitment to the Latino community of WCL. It was named after Mr. Edward Bow, class of 1958, for his numerous contributions to the Washington College of Law's Latino, Latina students and to the overall WCL community. Corey Alonso Yoder is a professor of law at Georgetown University's law Georgetown University Law Center and the director of the Federal Legislation Clinic. Previously, she served as a practitioner in residence at American University Washington College of Law Law's Immigrant Justice Clinic. And she also served at the Whitman Walker House um, Organization in their Legal Services Program, AYUDA, where she established an innovative project to protect notorio fraud victims. Currently, she serves as a vice chair on the board of directors of Centro de los Derechos del Migrante. It's a U.S.-Mexico workers' right organization, among other board organizations that she is currently involved with. She is a graduate of WCL and Georgetown University. In 2011, Corey received the Premio Inspiración during that year's Hispanic Law Conference. Congratulations, Corey, and please help me welcoming Corey.
Congratulations, Corey, all you. Thank you so much, Dina. Muchas gracias. And thank you for the very kind introduction and warm welcome. I'm so honored to be receiving this award here with you all tonight and incredibly grateful to the Board of Latino Alumni uh, Association of the Washington College of Law for nominating me. Um, you all are a uh, board that is composed of an impressive group of activists, advocates, and community lawyers, each in your own right. To be recognized by these great peers is particularly humbling to me. And speaking of humbling, I don't think I uh, can properly express the thrill of learning that I would receive this award as an opening act to the iconic Dolores Huerta. I commit that I will do my utmost to speak about myself and avoid the temptation to dissolve into a fangirl tribute to her. Despite this commitment, I think it's critically important to mention how Dolores Huerta, for me, a Mexican-American lawyer, is an inspiration and a form of representation that has often been denied to young Latinx, especially women, that we do have a place in the history and the future of this country. I have not wanted for incredible role models. Both of my parents instilled in me from earliest memories a sense of political and community purpose that I strive to replicate in my own life and to model now for my son, Pablo. Uh, as an immigrant to the US, my father demonstrated to me the importance and dignity of work in every position from day laborer to public school ESL teacher and many others that he had performed along the way. My mother modeled how to connect with and be in service to communities, serving as the primary caregiver to me and my sister while working full-time as a social worker with teens and young adults. Perhaps most importantly from both of my parents, I learned the importance of resilience. And I try my utmost in working with the next generation of socially active lawyers to find that power within themselves. I also strive to channel the extraordinary privileges I've had in my life for the issues that Dolores Huerta championed and remain just as relevant today as when she began her work decades ago. In particular, the struggle of migrant and seasonal workers, Latinx access to healthcare, and discrimination based on gender or sexual orientation are all issues on which I hope my efforts might make some meaningful improvement. And I encourage you to check out Centro de los Derechos del Migrante's website, cdmigrante.org, cdmmigrants, e with an e at the end, dot org to see how you can support the, uh, the work that we, that we do with migrant seasonal workers. Whatever the result of my own efforts to alleviate the injustices in these areas, I am assured that the dozens of young lawyers with whom I've had the pleasure to work and instruct are well positioned to dismantle these injustices. It's my humble wish that representation in the form of my example will have provided some inspiration to them along the way I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to have worked with them, to know them, and to continue to mentor so many of them in their next uh, chapters of life as they continue the struggle that we've all contributed to improving in, in some small measure along the way. Muchas gracias a mi familia, a mi Pablito, mi Andres, and my family members who are watching. Uh, I love you all. And thank you so much, everyone, for this opportunity again. Great, uh, thank you so much, Corey. Uh, next, we are recognizing the recipient of the Goldman Grossman Award, Christian Franco Cortez, a graduating LLM student. Established in 2007, the Goldman Grossman Award recognizes an LLM student who has demonstrated an exceptional commitment to the national and or international Latino Latina community. It was named after Professor Robert Goldman and Dean Claudio Grossman, renowned experts in the inter-American legal system and pioneers in the International Legal Studies Program. At WCL, Christian serves as the president of the LLM board. He's cur he currently interns at the World Bank Group in a project that measures the regulations that enhance business activity across the world. Previously, he worked at ICETEX, which provides equal opportunity for education in foreign universities. 
He also holds a law degree and a postgraduate degree from Universidad Autonoma de Colombia and Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Bogota. Please join me in welcoming Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, there are panel speakers and attendees. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Hispanic Law Conference, uh, American University, Washington College of Law, the Hispanic Bar Association of the District of Columbia, Latin American Law Students Association, uh, the Latino Alumni Association of Washington College of Law. So, um, I have no words to thank you enough uh, for selecting me for this recognition. I'm very honored and happy to be able to make a positive impact in the Latino community through my altruistic commitment to service. Um, if there is something that makes me feel proud of um, be here in this country, it's the strength and unity of um, the Latino community. and its efforts to show all the value that we can contribute for um, from any front or environment. Um, four years ago, I didn't know how to speak English at all. And for me, it's uh, incredible being here and saying these words to you. Um, the first thing I have to say is that I could stay here in the United States um, thanks to other Latinos that were able to see some potential in achieving my dreams. Since I didn't know how to speak English, I did not have uh, in mind to study and, and get my LM degree. So I started working very hard, hard to achieve this um, primary goal, goal to complete my master's degree. Um, in these four years, um, I have had witness how the Latino community has struggled fighting for his very basic rights and that has encouraged me to return some of the help uh, that I have received uh, for the very fact that um, I'm a Latino as well. So, and um, I thank the university and um, all the persons involved in this um, award, and I'm incredibly uh, grateful for it. So um, it's pretty hard for me to be far away from my family I have no family here. Uh, all my, my parents and uh, the rest of my family is in Colombia. Uh, so for me, now the WCL community and all the Latino community, you are my family here. So um, I want to thank my parents uh, first and uh, all my friends and all the person and people who has believed in me and have been involved in my process. Um, um, I, I have done always, like, um, I have worked very hard uh, to achieve my dreams, but um, especially, um, again, um, I have been kind of helping in a very altruistic way. And this is the way uh, I feel this is the life is uh, retributing me. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. And um I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christian, and, and congratulations again. Uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, it is an honor to present the Premio Solidaridad to Monica Palacio, the former director of the District Office of Human Rights. OHR, and current candidate for DC Council at large. The Premio Solidaridad is awarded annually in recognition of an individual or organization that has contributed to the advancement of the Hispanic community of the Washington DC metropolitan area. Monica has appoint, was appointed under two DC mayors to serve as the Director of the Office of Human Rights from 2013 to 2019 and directed the Language Access Program from 2011 to 2013. As Director of the OHR, the District's Civil Rights Enforcement Agency, 
Monica has a team of, that investigated thousands of civil rights complaints of discrimination. If elected, she will be the first person of Latino descent to serve on the DC Council. Monica is a graduate of Georgetown University Law Center and Fordham University. In 2015, the Hispanic Bar Association of DC awarded her the Hugh A. Johnson Jr. Memorial Award for her strong contributions to the legal professions. Please help me welcome Monica. Thank you. We can't hear you, Monica. So oh, sorry, I've been muted for so long, I forgot. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Dean Taylor. Thank you, Dina and Macarena, Lucero, everyone who's done such a fantastic job on this conference. I'm really humbled and, and deeply appreciate this award. Um, it's been such a challenging year and to think that you were able to put together this brilliant conference and that I was able to uh, get on the list of nominees for this amazing award um, means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Um, I love the word solidaridad. Uh, for me, that word captures um, everything I've tried to do throughout my career is bring people together to solve problems and make sure that we're helping families and helping our most vulnerable communities. So this award is particularly special to me because I'm receiving it right now in the middle of a gigantic, enormous project I'm working on, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But I do want to share a little bit about my story because the Washington College of Law has always been very important to me. And uh, I'm originally from Colombia, so I want to say to Cristian also, if you need some empanadas, feel free to call me and just come over. Um, so I'm originally from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I moved to New York City uh, when I was less than three years old because my mother had a nursing scholarship. And I saw her example in public service throughout my childhood. She was a New York City public nurse for more than 30 years. And, uh, and I decided very young, I was, I was around 10 years old when I decided I was gonna be a lawyer because lawyers can help people and change things. And that's all I needed to know. Um, I then um, apply, you know, went to college, applied myself, you know, made sure that I had the grades and, and the track record to get into law school. And when I applied to law school, you know, Georgetown was the first school to accept me. And I sure enough packed my bags and started moving to DC immediately uh, in my mind back then. And that, that was in 1990. So I've been in the district now 30 years. And uh, one of my fondest memories of law school and being a law student, um, because they're not all fun, fond memories, right? Those are tough times, um, was working with the Latino Law Students Associations of the DC area. And at the time, we started something called the National Latino Law Student Association. I don't know if it's still around, but my favorite students and the students that I thought were the most well-rounded and most mature and most you know, professional and open to ideas and change were the students at the Washington College of Law. So I'm so excited uh, to be part of the WCL family, uh, by extension, winning this award uh, with all of you. So I'll just mention a few things. Um, you know, I, I struggled as a student to understand uh, my role as an attorney in the world in terms of serving uh, in systems that didn't always deliver justice and systems that were often skewed unfairly and driven by economics. So I turned kind of away from a traditional career in law to find a social justice path. And I've pursued that now for over 27 years, but my experiences in law school, uh, doing the juvenile justice clinic, representing kids that were being adjudicated um, back in the early 90s, shaped my career goals and put me on the track of public service. And it was about 11 years ago that I found my way back to working in a more traditional legal role uh, at the Office of Human Rights. And in 2013, I became the first Latina appointed to be director of the Office of Human Rights um, for the District of Columbia. And that office is the agency charged with enforcing our anti-discrimination statutes, both federal and local. And that agency grew, uh, doubled in size while I was there. So there's a lot I would love to tell you about the Office of Human Rights, but you can read about it and find out more. Most importantly, 
it gave me a big picture. Um, as Dr. Rios was saying today, it gave me a bigger picture at how often Latino voices and Latino leaders do not have a presence at the decision-making table. We are not able to help chart the course um, in terms of delivery of services, in terms of educational priorities, in terms of public safety. And that is something I saw over and over again over my career in DC and, and nationally. And I was troubled by it so much so that I abandoned <laughs> my position um, serving under the current mayor in DC to be the first Latina to run for a DC council seat in our city's history. And yes, that is exactly as daunting as it might sound uh, because, um, because I'm a public interest attorney. So I've, I don't have ties to you know, firms or corporations or big dollars. Um, but thankfully DC uh, began in this election cycle, the Fair Elections Program, which is our public campaign financing program, which is an essential tool in leveling the playing field. So folks like me, um, can consider running for office because you do have to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to, to do so. So I share this with you to say that it's been an incredible journey uh, to be on this path to become the first elected Latina council member here in the District of Columbia in the nation's capital and one of the biggest, most powerful countries in the world. It's been quite a challenge, but I've already learned so much and I am thrilled to share all of that with any of you who might aspire to political office one day. And I'll just close by saying that um, it's, it's really truly a privilege and honor to be with all of you today, to have participated in just part of the conference um, and to know that you're doing such excellent work in charting a course for all of us nationally and in the DMV in terms of what our priorities need to be as we move through this health crisis and think about the effects of racism and systemic racism and think about the effects of having a voice and full representation in every elected um, body that we have in, you know across this region so um, i thank you so much uh, the premio Solidar Solidar solidaridad will be in good hands and I hope to participate in all future conferences. Um, so thank you to everyone once again. Thank you, Monica, and congratulations again. So uh, we are going to turn it over to uh, the chair of our committee uh i'd like to introduce lucero ortiz oh um, lisa before I'm we do uh we just want to take a moment to thank um everyone who has uh been part of this planning for the 22nd annual hispanic law conference and we're so grateful for everyone's hard work this has been a team effort under the leadership of lucero ortiz lucero thank you for getting us all together and coordinating this on a virtual basis. This has been unprecedented. Usually it's a dinner, it's an event, and this has just been uh, really, I speak for myself, it has been a pleasure to work with um, a group of wonderful faculty, professors, volunteers, alums, staff. And so um, Lisa, why don't we take a moment and read uh, some of the people who have contributed to this. And I'll start off by thanking the WCL Washington College of Law Special Events and their Continuing Legal Education Office, their staff, Denise Richard, Court, uh, Richards, Courtney Watson, and the WCL tech team. Thank you to Ryan it ha um, for getting all the technical logistics taken care of, and this couldn't have been done without the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Affinity Relations, Dean uh, Lisa Taylor and Derek Tanner. Thank you so much for uh, your support for this conference and all the logistics and typing up the conference program. And we want to thank WCL faculty and staff, which include Michelle Assad, Ava Brandt, Frankie Fritter, Dean Claudio Grossman, uh, Claudia Martin, Diego Rodriguez Pinzon, Macarena Saiz, and Brooke Sandoval. Thank you so much for your time, your efforts that you have contributed to this. 
Also, thank you to the Hispanic Bar Association of the District of Columbia, President Ruben Reyna. Thank you for participating in this conference and for co-sponsoring this and getting your organization behind this conference. And uh, the Latin American Law Students Association, LALSA, this, um, you truly have been a voice for our students on campus and truly brought a young, vibrant perspective to this conference. Thank you to Sandy Arce, William Chavez, Paola del Valle Torres, and Scarlett Montenegro. Thank you for your contributions. And I'd like to thank uh, my fellow board members at the Latina Latino Alumni Association of the Washington College of Law, Javier Alban, Nicole Martinez, Lucero Ortiz, Natasha Quiroga, and other uh, board members and alums and volunteers and friends of the Latinx community who have truly made this um, conference possible. Uh, Dean Taylor, I don't know if I missed anybody. Um, any uh, additions you want to add? Uh, I, I can't remember whether you thanked uh, Brooke Sandoval as well. We'll give her a double thanks just in case I, okay. I, I mentioned, but Brooke, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for getting the word out to potential students who are thinking about applying to WCL or are applying in the process or have been admitted. Thank you for setting that out. A special thank you to Dean Dienerstein. Thank you for being part of this conference, for your support in making this possible. Um, anything else, Lisa, that I've missed? Anything we should add before we get to the big keynote speaker? Uh, no, I think you, you got everyone. I, I believe you also got uh, Dean Grossman as well, who was an uh, integral part of the uh, planning committee. Um, as we mentioned over and over, this is the 20, 22nd anniversary of this conference. So this conference is embedded in the DNA of WCL. So it was a pleasure that for us to have this conference, despite the fact that we had to do it virtually. But I think uh, having it virtually opened up some opportunities for us. Um, it, it does not be having it uh, in person. Uh, and seeing faces, but I really want to thank everyone that uh, participated in it and thank everyone that joined well. us. I'm sorry? Again, thank you to all the award recipients. Definitely, absolutely, an amazing group of people. So thank you, everyone. And great, now this uh, we've been waiting for this moment. I'm going to turn it over to Lucero Ortiz. She has been our leader. Uh, without her, this conference would not have been possible. So Lucero, it's all you. Gracias. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dina and Lisa, for uh, spearheading and uh, serving as our masters of ceremony for the awards program. I want to also uh, congratulate y decirles felicidades de todo corazón to all of our award recipients. Um, through this award program, we really try to highlight the contributions of the Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic community to the legal profession in uh, general, but also here in the Washington, D.C. community. Uh, and we really try to make sure that we highlight uh, law students, uh, LLM students, alumni, and others in the community who have worked like Monica has uh, with WCL and other Washington DC institutions throughout the years. I'm taking a moderator's privilege at this point to highlight the tremendous leadership of Paula del Valle Torres. She is the current president of the Latin American Law Student Association, better known as LALSA. Paula has been instrumental to the success of this three-day conference, particularly because it was the first time that we've been all virtual. Um, as I just mentioned, we have several generations represented in the planning of this conference. And if it were not for Paula and her executive board, uh, we might have been caught on the other side of the digital divide. Thank you so much. We applaud your vision, your creativity, and your enthusiasm, and really making sure that we highlight, um, again, the uh, important contributions of the Latino and Hispanic community to the Washington College of Law, Washington, D.C., and the greater profession. We are incredibly grateful to you, Paula. 
And I know Paula's on. Can we just have her say hello and wave? Thank you so much. Round of applause. Fantastic. As we await um, the arrival of Dolores Huerta, the president and founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, I'm going to just take a moment um, of silence. Um, so for those of you that are joining us, um, we are going to keep our cameras on um, and we will rejoin in just a minute. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Alicia Huerta. Just letting you know the Lotus is on. And when you're ready, we'll bring her to the seat. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alicia. We're ready when you when you are. Okay. Hey. Hello, Dolores, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, of course, it is our honor and privilege. I'm going to go ahead and get started. 
Again, my name is Lucero Ortiz, and I am a proud member of the Washington, D.C. legal community um, and a proud Californian. It is truly, truly an honor and a privilege to introduce you to the woman of the hour, the incomparable Dolores Huerta, president and founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Welcome, Dolores. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to celebrate the, the Latinos. Thank you, Dolores. If this were a live event, this is where we would all stand up and applaud and you would get a standing ovation for all of your trajectory and amazing contributions to the United States. So I, I will do the little that I can to give you that applause. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, just in terms of the, um, the, the plan for this afternoon, I will be asking Ms. Huerta a series of questions to kick off the conversation, and we'll also hear from four colleagues later in the program. I invite all of you that are watching to read Dolores's bio and accomplishments in the conference program. If you have not seen the documentary Dolores on PBS Independent Lens, I highly encourage you to do that as soon as this program is over. That project spearheaded by Santana and the beautiful Bratt brothers, Ms. Huerta talks about the need for all of us to work through our communities and with our communities with an organizing strategy at the grassroots level grounded in the power of the people. Now, Dolores, as we sit here in October of 2020, during a global public health pandemic and calls for economic and social reforms, I can't help but think of all of the decades of advocacy that you've been involved with. You've been a vocal champion for social justice for over 60 years, during which time humanity has been presented with equally urgent challenges. Now, you've been described, and I know from personal experience, that you are tireless, incansable. How have you maintained your strength to remain optimistic and stay true to your si se puede attitude? Well, because I have lived a long time, I have been able to see the accomplishments that we have been able to achieve, not only my organization and the farm workers and other groups, that we have been able to achieve many measures of justice. You know, we know that it's come by with a lot of hard work, with a lot of dedication, and of course with people not giving up. Uh, we recently celebrated the 100 years of women's suffrage. And when we see those documentaries and think the women, you know, they, they kept at it, you know, not only decade after decade, but generation after generation until they finally won for all of us the right for women to vote. Uh, that, it really inspires me. And, and when I look back on my life and I can think of the changes that have, that have been made, the good changes that have been accomplished. And so I know that uh, democracy works, that when people work hard at making something happen and they stay together, they take direct action. Yes, that we can make improvement, even though we know we have setbacks and there are people that are trying to take away uh, those uh, achievements from us, uh, but we can get them back. We just have to keep working at it and not give up. Thank you, Dolores. As an activist and an organizer, you worked with many attorneys throughout your career. Um, you have a long list of legislation that you've been able to shepherd across both state and federal legislatures. And one thing that's important for us um, as a legal community is working with organizers and understanding the role and the importance of organizers in the work that we do in our, in our industry, in our profession. What advice do you have for ensuring that organizers and attorneys work in the most efficient way? Well, I believe that uh, I wish that everybody could become an organizer because I think that uh, when we go out there and we uh, get people involved, uh, uh, get them involved in reaching out to their neighbors, to their friends about any particular issue, and that we can then take direct action and make the changes that we need to make. And of course, a lot of it comes back down to voting uh, because ultimately the only way that we can make permanent change is by making sure that whatever issue that we want, whatever change that we want, that it's gotta be institutionalized, it's gotta be put in the form of legislation, it's gotta be a law that can be implemented, it can be enforced, and the people have to be held accountable if they do not carry out the law. 
And uh, so th that's what, what inspires me to know that we can make this happen and that it starts at the, at the, at the bottom and starts at the basis of just working with people and talking to them, making them understand the issues and, and how they can get involved to make those changes. To me, that's so exciting. And I guess it's called the democracy. <laughs> But when you break it down and, and uh, when people really understand that they have the power to make changes, to me, it, it is like finding a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow because our lives can become so much richer and we know that we find that, that God-given power uh, which exists in, in us, in, in, in our persons, and we might even say in our bodies, and that we have uh, these gifts that, that we can use and oftentimes we do, they're latent uh, they're, they're, they're dormant because we don't use them. But once we discover that we have the energy and make things happen, oh my God, to me, it, it is so exciting. Thank you. I definitely have to say that I've had the privilege of um, hearing you speak live on many occasions. And again, because of this pandemic, uh, I'm sorry that many of the folks that are hearing you speak for the first time are, are, are having to do over Zoom and not live. Um, but in many of those occasions, uh, you've ended um, your uh, remarks and presentations by really focusing again on the power of the people. Um, and that's something that for me, I think is so important. Many of the law students at the Washington College of Law and really in the profession as a whole are first generation. Many of us are um, really entering spaces and having to negotiate um, different spaces uh, uh, in the profession uh, and in our society. And so really making sure that we're connected back to the grassroots is so important. Now, while you're most widely known for being the co-founder of the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez, being the lead negotiator for the UFW with the growers and the architect of the great boycott, we'd like to really highlight your work with the Dolores Huerta Foundation since 2003, you've been able to grow the organization to 20 organi organizing communications and administrative staff and interns focused on programs on civic education, LGBT equality, health, women, and youth development. With the presidential election coming in uh, in 20 days, um, or 19 days, I'm, I'm losing track, Talk to us about your work at the Dolores Huerta Foundation and particularly around the census and voting rights. Well, we have grown uh, now. We actually have 40 full-time staff people. And during the census work, and of course now during the get out the vote work, uh, we've actually uh, got, going to have probably about 100 canvassers out there. And even during the pandemic, and uh, we have done a lot of our work uh, uh, doing uh, phoning, doing outreach and, and phone banking to get people to sign up for the census and also uh, to support us in some of the pro important propositions that we're working on here uh, in California and then also uh, to get out the vote. So we have uh, over 100 staff that we have right now. And during the pandemic, we've done a number of different things. Uh, we've done food banks. We've had weekly food banks and in uh, four different areas of California, starting with the Kern County, Fresno, Tulare County, and the Antelope Valley, which is the high desert of California. Uh, so those, we've been doing those in different places at different times, but especially uh, kind of uh, aiming those uh, to the farm worker community. All the farm workers were uh, working. They've been the essential workers putting food on people's table. And the fact is that one of the people in the family had to stay home with the children because children, of course, uh, cannot go to school right now. So uh, those families have taken like a, uh, an income hit, a very bad income hit where they are only getting half of, of the income that they were doing before the pandemic. So we have been trying to help them out with, with phone banking. We've also done fundraising uh, so that we can uh, give some of the families some monetary relief that they need for their rent or other necessities that they have, especially the undocumented uh, workers. Uh, so we have been very, very active and also giving them information on places and res uh, where they can uh, get the resources that they need uh, uh, in some of the special programs that we have here in California, uh, thanks to our great uh, governor and our great legislature, uh, Gavin Newsom, who's our governor and our, and our state uh, a democratic legislature that we have here in California. Uh, they were able to give a, a, a special 
uh, funding to uh, parents for each of their children uh, that they had uh, in uh, the elementary schools and high schools. So that helped the families a lot. We know that they need a lot more. Uh, and then on the census, uh, we did everything that we could trying to get people to sign up for the census. We sued the Trump administration along with other organizations and with the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. And of course we won, uh, so they couldn't put that uh, a question of citizenship on the, on the census questionnaire. Yeah, but even with that, so many of the families uh, were afraid to sign up for the census. And we know, I think today is the last day that people can sign up, but that we did uh, a lot of social media, a, a lot of radio shows, uh, television shows uh, to get people to sign up for the census. And we were, we were able to get a lot of them to sign up with that fear that they have. And I'm, I'm not even going to call it fear, I'm going to call it terror. And of course, this is what President Trump did from the day he came down that, on that escalator, calling Mexicans criminals and rapists and drug dealers, uh, all of the deportations that were taking place, especially targeting California, uh, because we have uh, so many, all of the cities here are sanctuary cities and a sanctuary state. And so uh, the, it has, there has been a brutal attack on immigrants uh, in our country right now. And so we can understand why people are afraid uh, to, you know, to, to participate in the census. We did everything that we could uh, to erase that fear and reaching out and talking. Unfortunately, I don't think we got the numbers uh, that we should have gotten to sign up for the census, especially in the undocumented community. Uh, but I have to say that we did the best that we could, even having taco trucks <laughs> you know, go out there giving out soccer balls and, and uh, you know, doing bringing people in and, and uh, even with our food banks, when people would get their food, would say, you want some food? Have you signed up for the census? We can sign you up right now. And then of course, going door to door also. Although our canvassers, they have shields, uh, they have masks and, and uh, they have goggles. They're very, very, they're very well protected while they're doing the work because we don't want uh, to anybody to be jeopardized because we all know that it's been Latino, indigenous and, uh, black folks who have been the, the most heavily hard hit by the census, by I mean, by the by COVID nineteen. Thank you, Dolores. And talk to us a little bit about the work that you've done um, around voting rights, um, which is so closely connected to the census. We know that the census is a way for uh, for states uh, to designate. Um, representatives uh, and also different resources and appropriations um, to our cities. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the extension of that census work into voting rights and um, the work that that you are doing in your personal capacity and also through the foundation for the upcoming elections. Well, that's one of the things that we had to explain to folks that it's not just about bringing money into your community, which of course when they sign up for the census, where that means in California, we get like $2,500 per person when that, uh, the trillion and a half dollars is redistributed. And we say to folks, look, if you're invisible, that money is not going to come into our communities and the money comes in for, uh, for schools and for healthcare, uh, for infrastructure in our community. So we explain that to people and hopefully uh, California will not lose any congressional seats. Uh, you know, because some folks did not, not sign up for the census. And we explain voting to them and make the, making them understand why voting is important. We're doing a really, really big push on get out the vote. We've had the outreach circles that are calling people about some of these important propositions that we have right now in California. And all of our staff is, is geared up right now. We're going to be doing human billboards, which means that we stand up on the corner of a street. And I want to recommend that to everybody out there for your favorite candidate, hopefully it's mine, which is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and I'm standing up on a corner with a, with a, with a poster board uh, in big letters saying, please vote for, yes, uh, Biden, Harris, or vote for this proposition or vote for the candidate that you wanna get elected. Uh, so all of our staff will be doing that, uh, standing up on the street corners at busy intersections or when cars are coming off of the freeway and they can see our signs out there. Because obviously uh, we don't have the money that the opposition has to buy a lot of, lot of ads uh, on television. So we've got to do it the old fashioned way. Uh, we've got to do it with people. But the other thing that we do with my foundation 
and in addition to uh, making uh, people really understand how important civic engagement is, we get them to run for office. So we have one of the young men that is running right now for a recreation board in one of our communities was the head of our youth group. And now he's a candidate uh, for the rec recreation district. We have another young woman who was also part of our team group who is now running for city council. So uh, we've had uh, some of our members that have uh, uh, sat on school boards and utility water district boards and, 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 uh, and that's one of the things that we do. We encourage the people that we organize even if they don't have a college education, uh, that they are smart enough, intelligent enough uh, to be able to get on some of these public boards. Uh, because really it's all about taking the power and that's what we need to do. Uh, we have one young man in California, when he was elected to the city council, he was only 19 years old, he became the mayor and he has gone against the big oil companies. This is a small town here in the Central Valley called Arvin, California. But it's kind of famous because that's where the uh, Grapes of Wrath was filmed, uh, where uh, uh, what's it, Henry Fonda, Woody Guthrie, all of these good, John Steinbeck, they were all there in that town uh, when they made that film. Well, now that town, Arvin, California, has a young mayor who is now, I think he's now 25 years old. And uh, when he was elected, uh, he uh, banned fracking. <laughs> this is a, now this is Kern County. Uh, near Bakersfield, California. This is the hub of the oil industry in California. Uh, but this young mayor said no fracking. The other thing that he did is that he opened up the whole area uh, in that city or, and they have a lot of empty grounds out there uh, that they could grow cannabis. So, so this is kind of the courage uh, that comes up from the grassroots and you have these young people that are fearless and they're going out there and, and getting elected. And of course, this is such an example for everybody else to see these young people, uh, Latinos run and get elected uh, to office. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Thank you. And, and it's a true testament that politics is personal, right? And so I think sometimes we feel very removed from people that are making decisions at the federal, at the state level, sometimes even in our own cities. Uh, but politics is about people and it's about making sure that the communities are reflected in their representatives. With the changing demographics, uh, as you know, and all of us uh, at this conference know, the US is on track to become a majority minority country in the next 20 years, in our lifetimes. And uh, I'd really like to know what priorities do you want us and um, really uh, a call to action today would want us to focus on for the next two decades? That is a very, very profound question because we know that the racism in our country is systemic and that it really colors every single branch of government, it, it, our educational system, our criminal justice system, you know, the courts, everything, everywhere you turn around, our health system uh, are very, you might say the way that they are structured right now, it is very hard for young people of color uh, to be able to get careers, to be able to get the kind of support and that they need. And so, and I know a lot of this can be, has to be done ultimately uh, by the legal profession, by all of you uh, out there. And so we have to start looking at these and we have to start uh, attacking them and changing, changing them. We need profound changes. And there's a saying in Spanish that says, uh, no hay nada mal que algo bien no salga. There is nothing so bad that nothing, there's nothing so bad that something good uh, will come out of it. And I think when we get out of this pandemic and we have seen what the impact of the pandemic has been on people of color, Latinos, indigenous, uh, uh, black folk, that we know that we need to make some major, major changes. Uh, I didn't mention the health industry also and the prison industry all of these things that have to be changed. And if we want our people of color to be able, number one, to get the equitable education that they deserve and that they need, that we've got to make a lot of changes because the racism is so embedded, especially in our educational system, that we can say that it is rigged. One of the things that our foundation is fighting uh, to stop the school to prison pipeline 
We sued our own high school district here because they had expelled 2,100 students in a year, 2,100. And of course they were hundreds of times uh, higher than the white kids, the black kids and the brown kids, they're the ones that were getting expelled. Uh, we won the lawsuit, but even to this date, this was several years ago, and by the way, we're going back into court with them uh, in December. To this day, they refuse to do a Black History Month. Uh, they refuse to do an Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, Almost 70% of the students are kids of color. And unfortunately, 80% of the teachers are white. Uh, and uh, they recruit from the Deep South. These are the people that they recruit to, uh, to be teachers in the school system. So the racism is embedded so strongly. And this is not true just of Kern County, Bakersfield, California, which is something like Alabama, by the way. Uh, people think of California as being so liberal, but we all of what we call the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley, the agricultural areas, uh, we still have a very strong a racist, uh, white, powerful structure. And of course, this is true of other parts of the United States of America. And so, uh, you know, we have to fight really, really hard to change all of this. And I think that, of course, is the, the division that we are seeing right now in our country. Uh, we, people of color, we always knew that the racism existed. We as women always knew that the sexism existed. Uh, we're happy to see it come out to the forefront where people can see it as a visual. Uh, it's visual, it's hurtful, but at least it's transparent so we can now identify those out there that are the racist. We can identify the systems that are racist. And our job is to dismantle the systems of oppression and racism. And when I say that, I am quoting the great uh, Reverend Jim Lawson, who was a person that uh, went into the South with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, to teach uh, the tactics and the principles of nonviolence. But that's what we have to do. It's a big job. And I, I want all of you out there to think about that and think how do we dismantle, how do we take these systems apart, how do we take these structures apart so that we can create a society in the United States of America where people of color can take their rightful place and be respected and be given the opportunities. Uh, we are going to be able to, I believe after this pandemic, we are going to be able to do that, but it's going to take all of us working very, very hard there are people that are going to fight tooth and nail. And I want to add to this to say that we know that the racism out there exists because of ignorance, just sheer ignorance, because people do not understand. I heard a, a young man from Guatemala uh, say to the other day, you know, we are not the immigrants to this country. We, this is our land. You know, we are the people of this land, the true immigrants of the people that came from Europe. And yet they make us feel like we are the strangers. And there's a great movie, by the way, called A Foreigners in Their Own Land. It's on PBS. I recommend it for people to see that. And I also like to say to people, Google a map of the United States before 1848. And it's always a shocker to see that a third of the United States was Mexico. So when they tell us, go back where you came from, we have to say, no, we are where we came from. This is where we are originals here and we deserve to be here. And uh, so we have to work to end the racism. We have to be anti-racist and we have to dismantle those structures of racism that exist. I know that was a long answer, but as you can see, and I know a lot of us feel very passionate about this uh, because we know that this uh, ignorant system of racism has to end. And I, I love to say to people out there and uh, that, you know, we are one human race, one human race, homo sapiens. We don't have a lot of different races. We have a lot of different ethnic groups. I would love to see the word race only used in conjunction with the word human. And of course, we all came, our human race began in Africa. Human civilization began in Africa. This is where our human race began. And that means that we out there, that we are all Africans of different shades and colors. So we can say to all of those neo-Nazis and the KKK, the white supremacists, get over it, you're Africans already. Okay, let's do it, get over it. Thank you, Dolores. And of course, uh, this week we recognize Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday. Um, and for those of us that have been through law school, one of the first cases, Supreme Court cases that we read as law students is Johnson v. McIntosh. 
where the property laws were established to really um, dispossess indigenous communities of their tribal lands. Um, and we know that we, all of us in the United States are living on indigenous lands. And so the importance, as you noted, of really making sure that we understand our history and the, the importance of ethnic studies um, and really it, that it's national and international um, and, and the, the different parallel, uh, parallel uh, struggles and um, projects that, that we can be working on are, are very important. With that, I want to invite four members of our legal com community into this conversation. Um, first, I want to introduce Dina Navar or reintroduce her. She is the chair of the Latino Latina Alumni Association and she has a question for you. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, Ms. Huerta. We Good heard afternoon. that you love to dance and at one time you considered a career in the arts. We want to know what is your favorite song of all time and is there a recent song that you have on repeat? Oh, uh, actually, uh, I, have, I think I have a lot of songs and uh, some of the songs that I like is uh, Because I'm an Activist is the Mar Marvin Gaye song about what's going on, <laughs> which I think is very descriptive about what's happening to us today in today's world. Uh, I, I love jazz music. I think all the Charlie Parker songs are my favorite songs. The Duke Ellington song are my favorite songs. And I also like the classics. I, I love a lot of the Spanish composers and, of course, uh, George Gershwin. And uh, so I love all kinds of music. I can't really say that I have one favorite song. And I love the Latin music also, uh, especially uh, songs like uh, uh, that, are, that have guitars in them, the guitar trios. Uh, so I love all kinds of music. I can't really say that I have any particular favorite. I think one which reminds me of the Great Boycott that uh, was uh, the George Gershwin song, uh, Rhapsody in Blue. And the reason I like that is because uh, when we were doing the boycott in New York City, uh, we would have to get up like at uh, two o'clock in the morning uh, or one o'clock to make it to the produce markets in New York and be there when they opened up the market like at uh, two or three o'clock in the morning. And uh, hearing the Rhapsody in Blue reminded me of New York City uh, during the quiet time when we would be going to the produce market and then when it gets really, really busy, really busy, we will be coming back and you get all the cars honking and all of the activity. So every time I hear the Rhapsody in Blue, and I liked it, of course, when I was a, a kid. And then when I uh, it was in New York City, it always reminded me of that song. Thank you. Great. Our next question is from Lisa Taylor. She's the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Affinity Programs at Washington College of Law. Thank you, Lucero. And uh, thank you, Ms. Huerta. Uh, it's an honor to, to be able to speak with you today. And I want to thank you on behalf of WCL for participating here today. Um, we have a, a lot of lawyers here, but we have a lot of law students uh, as well. And I was wondering whether you uh, can give some advice to our young law students, uh, particularly uh, Latino, Latina, and Latinx uh, students who want to be engaged and want to be involved uh, in solving some of the problems uh, in the community. What advice will, can you give to them as lawyers who want to support the movement? Well, I want to thank you all for taking this plunge uh, to become attorneys. I know it's not easy, uh, even passing the bar, we know it's hard. You know, I have a son who's an attorney. I have a granddaughter who's an attorney who is working on asylum cases, which she loves. But I would say that uh, you're going to be very sorely needed just to kind of clean up the mess <laughs> that, uh, you know, the, the people that came before you. And uh, a lot of it is going to have to be done through lawsuits. And it's going to be really difficult because all of these conservative judges uh, that have been placed uh, on the courts uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, but you, I think uh, to kill, keep yourself, uh, I'm going to say, uh, not, not poor, but economically, don't get yourself in, involved in a lot of debt. I know maybe with school you have some debt. Hopefully someday that will change when we can have free tuition for everybody. 
but uh, keep yourself economically viable uh, so that you can help uh, uh, with, with the many organizations that are poor uh, to handle many of these lawsuits that we need uh, to challenge and change uh, the systemic racism that we have in our country. And, and not only uh, racism, but again, we have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of women's rights, LGBTQ rights, uh, prisoners' rights, you know, uh, getting rid of this, uh, this incarceration system that we have, uh, which uh, I always like to say is very close to fascism because we are making money off of the bodies of people that are being put in prisons. And uh, again, the criminal, the, the law enforcement uh, organizations have become so powerful, like even here in California where uh, people voted to reduce uh, many felonies to misdemeanors, uh, including the marijuana laws. And uh, a lot of people were, were released from prison uh, that, uh, that many of those uh, law enforcement groups are fighting that. As you all know, we have the biggest number of people in prison than any other country in the world, including, including India or China. So is, there's so much work to be out there, but if you, if you can keep yourselves not too indebted so that you can come and, and help on many of these, these issues where there is not a lot of money to pay you. And you're kind of going to be like community organizers going out there uh, with the, your sword of justice uh, to fight and, and to repeal laws and maybe pass other laws uh, that will help the people of color in our country. Uh, the people that we talked about there are going to be coming uh, the majority. So I wish you well. And uh, just be known that you are needed and that you are loved. And we are uh, waiting for you we are with open arms. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. I know for, uh, I'll speak for the law students, even though I'm not a law student, uh, it is a very difficult process to go through and to hear from you that they are loved and that they are needed really almost makes me emotional because especially during this pandemic, um, self-care and um, their mental health is so important. So thank you so much for, for really reaching out to them and uh, reminding them that they are loved and they are needed and a very important part of our community. With that, I want to actually bring in the president of the Latin American Law Student Association or LALSA, Paula del Valle Torres with her question. Good evening, Ms. Huerta. I just want to say on behalf of LALSA that you are truly an inspiration. And honestly, for a lot of us, our goal is to be like you and to be able to change lives like you've done. Um, and my question is, how do you view the current opportunities for women in education, the workforce, reproductive health, pay equity, and other spheres as we see a new era of effective leaders who happen to be women? I, I think we are seeing right now uh, what, how great women leaders are and how great they are at protecting people. And when we think of the uh, march for, uh, that the women are doing, uh, we had these marches all over the world that were started here in the United States. And the women's marches that were so incredible. Uh, and of course that, really propelled us a lot of women uh, that got elected to the U.S. Congress right now. We're at number 39. Uh, we know that eventually we want to get uh, uh, to represent our population of women, which would be over 50 percent. So we're on our way to, uh, to be able to do that. So the women leadership in the Black Lives Matter movement and the environmental movement, when I think of Greta, the young woman from Germany, Jane Fonda, who, by the way, everybody is dedicating the rest of her life uh, to work on global warming and on the environment and to get rid of fossil fuels. And by the way, she wrote a book. I hope all of you uh, will really buy her book. And it, it, the book is uh, basically saying, what can you do? You know, what can we do uh, to stop global warming? And all of the proceeds are going to be going to Greenpeace. So uh, please promote Jane's book for me, uh, you know, get it out there. We have seen that we, when we have women as governors or mayors that, uh, that uh, they actually have been uh, better at protecting uh, their constituents from COVID-19 than we have these um, men, <laughs> um, I'm gonna call them chauvinist uh, uh, governors that, that uh, have uh, cared more about the economy and about money coming in than they have about the health of women. And I like to quote Coretta Scott King uh, who said that we will never have peace in the world until women take power. And we know that because women, no woman wants to see her husband, brother, husband, uh, you know, 
uh, killed, her son killed in, in a war. And eventually I think we were going to see that happen. But uh, you know, the other thing that we have to talk about is about the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, the state of Virginia was the 38th state uh, to uh, vote for the Equal Rights Amendment. And now we have to get, get it ratified by our Senate. And so that we're gonna to have to do a lot of work to make sure that that gets ratified. And hopefully with the next administration uh, that that will happen. So uh, women, we have a lot of work to do, and, but we, don't, we do know we have a lot of leadership in all of these movements that are happening. And uh, I forgot to mention the movements against gun violence with Emma Gonzalez and a lot of the young people from Parkland, Florida, who were leading all of these marches uh, against gun violence. And of course, the changes that we need in our criminal justice system. Uh, so women are definitely leading the way. They're being celebrated and even you know, we know that as women, we're going to get pushbacks. Uh, we're going to get people to get in our ways. And the thing is that we just have to figure if somebody gets in our way, we're just going to figure out how to go around them. Uh, we lost, of course, a, a great champion uh, with Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg. Uh, but I know that all of you out there are going to follow her path. She kind of paved the way. But I know many of you are going to follow her path and fight for justice, not only for women and people of color, but for everybody else out there uh, that needs uh, some justice in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. And you remind us to really make sure that we are uplifting our sisters in all of the work that, that we do. Um, I appreciate you telling us about Jane Fonda's book and the fact that you are working with so many of your sisters in the struggle um, across so many different um, advocacy and, um, and, and goals for social justice. With that, I want to introduce Ruben Reina. He's the president of the Hispanic Bar Association of the District of Columbia, or HBABC. Good evening, Ms. Huerta. Um, as a child of two migrant farmers myself, I want to personally thank you for all that you have done. My question is, you have a long list of awards and accolades. Which one stands out and what's one of your more most memorable experiences? Well, of course, uh, getting the Medal of Freedom from, from President Obama uh, really, I think, has to be the number one. Uh, but also getting uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt Award from uh, President uh, Clinton. And Hillary Clinton was there with him when he uh, gave me that award. Uh, that, of course, made me also uh, feel very proud. But then I have gotten other awards uh, that, that make me feel very proud, uh, you know, from our state Senate, uh, uh, Governor Jerry Brown uh, named uh, Dolores Huerta Day here in the state of California, April 10th, my birthday. And that was followed by uh, Governor Michelle Lujan in New Mexico, uh, Governor, uh, I think, uh, from uh, Washington State also. And, uh, and, and, and so that, that also makes me very proud. But when I get those awards, I do this on the, on the backs of all of those farm workers that, you know, went to jail, that were beaten, uh, five farm workers that were killed uh, just when we were fighting for basic human rights like toilets in the fields and cold drinking water, rest periods, unemployment insurance, the right to organize. So I, I, I get the awards, but at the same time, I know that, as I say, it's on the backs of so many hundreds of people uh, that are that have fought for justice and all the people out there in the United States of America that really helped the farm workers win, all those people out there. And I'm sure some of you, your fathers and mothers wouldn't let you eat grapes when you were kids uh, to help the farm workers. So it's really uh, on, on everybody's be behest and on their behalf that I receive these awards and recognitions. Thank you. Great, and as our audience knows, the Washington College of Law at American University was the first law school in the world founded by women. It was the first law school to have a woman dean and the first to graduate an all-female class. Um, for that reason, these issues of gender equality are very, very important to us um, at this institution, but obviously also in our profession. We want to talk about the evolution or lack thereof of gender equity during your career. Uh, particularly, we're seeing, uh, as Paula mentioned, more women in the public sphere, particularly candidates for public office. And we see that uh, women candidates are scrutinized for their appearance or for their communication style, if they seem too aggressive or 
um, are showing any type of emotion. What is your, uh, you've talked already about the importance of running for office. What is your advice for people running for office, uh, particularly female candidates? And what is your strategy for being an effective communicator and leader, um, particularly when debating people with opposing views? Well, I think just uh, being yourself is important. Uh, being able to uh, get those messages in simple languages uh, so that people can understand and that they, they can actually capture the message because sometimes, and I guess maybe for a lot of people that are starting to be attorneys, uh, this might be a problem, but it's just like when you're going to court and you have to present your case, uh, you have to do it in a way that uh, maybe sometimes not only the judge, but the jury can also understand uh, what, what you're fighting for. And this is the same thing when we're fighting for women's rights. And, and in our Latino community, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, many of us are Catholics or they come from evangelical religions and they still don't understand that women have a right to abortion and that this needs to be a human right for women. And so I think, and this is of course outside of, of the, the, the law that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about social culture and so too many uh, people in our community, in the Latino community, are still kind of not, they're not quite there yet. The, they're like we like to say sometimes, están poquitos tapados, right? And they don't understand that a woman's right to abortion is, is a human right that women have. And also uh, the same issue comes to gay rights. And, and when I mentioned gay rights and women's right to abortion, uh, Robert, uh, you know, we're having the, the hearings right now on the Supreme Court nominee and gay rights and, and uh, uh, Roe is also, these are very big topics right now that are being talked about. And I don't know about all of you, but I wish I could just hear every word of those Supreme Court hearings because I am learning a lot of law myself. And we say, darn, I should have become an attorney. Uh, my mother wanted me to become an attorney, but at, the, at that time, I never knew attorneys that really fought for social justice. So uh, I kind of declined that offer. But uh, hearing all the Supreme Court hearings and uh, when they discuss, discuss all of the uh, the different tangents of law and I think, wow, maybe I should have been an attorney. I hope that all of you are listening to these hearings also. I'm sure that you are. And, and, and if we think about that of having a woman, another woman on the bench of the Supreme Court, but then we have to understand there's a difference between just being a woman and being a feminist. And there is a really big difference because we know that feminists are those that really uh, support women's reproductive rights. They support gay rights, support immigrant rights. Uh, uh, you know, we're worried about the uh, uh, global warming. These are feminists, and sometimes we have to distinguish because between the word women and the word feminist. And then when we say the word feminist, we can also add men to that description because there are uh, most men out there, and I'm sure in this uh, particular. Uh, like a group of us that are meeting together, the men in our group are definitely feminists because they support women's right to choose. Thank you, Dolores. And as we are, are wrapping up, again, we want to thank you for your time and your lifetime uh, of commitment to so many issues that are so important to us, uh, not only personally, but also professionally. Um, with that, I want to um, just really get, give you the opportunity to give us any kind of closing remarks, uh, a call to action, things to think about as, uh, again, we're a couple of weeks away from a presidential election, as we are um, seven, eight months, I'm losing count of how many months we've been in this global pandemic. Um, and also as we really think about um, the, the future of our community um, and uh, for those law students entering into the legal profession, uh, by the way, Dolores, it's not too late to go to law school, so uh, <laughs> I would say that maybe uh, by the time you're 93, you could be an attorney just like us. Um, so I would say get started as soon as possible, and uh, we're, I'm happy to mentor you or tutor you if you need any help in, uh, in property law. Um, so with that, would you like to close um, with any, any comments? Well, I think, you know, I didn't go to law school, but I was able to uh, uh, being political director of the community service organization, the United Farm Workers, and uh, my own organization that I have been instrumental in passing a lot of laws like the Amnesty Bill of 1986, uh, where a lot of uh, our people got their legalization status in the United States of America. 
And uh, by the way, we have to give that credit to uh, the, the late uh, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, Schumer, who is now the head of the Center for the Democratic Party, uh, Peter Rodin of New Jersey, and Howard Berman of California. Reagan only signed that bill. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll have to just stick with being a, a legislative advocate and uh, probably not go to law school because we have a lot of organizing that we still need to do. And I would hope that in my lifetime, I can see the day when the District of Columbia actually is able to elect uh, their own senators and their own congresspersons. Uh, this is something that's been on the table since the 60s and it still hasn't happened. And so uh, the elections matter so much. I like to say election day is the most important day of your life besides the day that you were born. And I just hope everybody out there that we can call five people that we know, get them to call five people that they know, get them to call five other people that they know. And so we can make this huge, huge web of, uh, of phone calls and, and the internet and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, uh, all of the devices that people have today that we didn't have back there in the 60s uh, to encourage people to vote. Uh, because when we say in this election, vote as if your life depends on it, it does. Your life depends on it. Yes, it does. So just encourage everybody to vote. And the one thing I forgot to mention is that the great Gloria Steinem also has a movie uh, that is out now. It's called The Glorious and it's on Amazon Prime. So everybody out there, we have to keep getting uh, connected, educating, uh, keep working. Yes, we can create this world of justice, of peace, you know, and, but the one thing that we have to really know is that it won't happen unless we do it. We can't wait for somebody else to come and do it for us. It's our responsibility and we have to make it happen. So we can say a big old si se puede and I wanna thank all of you for having me. And I would love it if I could ask you all a question. Can I do that? Of course, please go ahead. Okay, can I kind of, this is a little chant that I, I like to end my lectures with and it's very simple. I'm just going to ask everybody out there one simple question. And, the, uh, and Dolores, but, can, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I just ask everybody to turn on their cameras? Those of you that are able to turn on your cameras, please turn on your cameras so that we can join Dolores in this um, exercise. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So, uh, the, and uh, if, I don't know if people can unmute or not, but I'm going to ask all the question. The question is very simple. I'm going to ask you, who's got the power? And I want you to say, we've got the power. And I want to ask you again, what kind of power? I want you to say people power. Can we do that? All right. Let's puede. Okay, that'll be the last one. <laughs> so, okay, first we'll say, okay, here it goes. One, two, three. Who's got the power? We've, We've got, got, got the power. power. What kind of power? People, people power. power. All right, so can we, can we create this world that we imagine of peace and justice for everyone. What do we say? Se puede o no se puede? Se puede. Se puede. Si se puede. Okay, let's si all do it together with an organized clap. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Si se puede. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for even considering having a celebration uh, to celebrate the Hispanic heritage, because by doing this, uh, we are not only reinvigorating ourselves, you know, giving ourselves a dignity that we deserve, but also educating others. So, muchas gracias, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dolores. Uh, we are truly honored um, to have you here with us uh, as a resident of the District of Columbia for, for many, many years. Um, I really appreciate you uh, elevating the, the need for the District of Columbia to become the 51st state of the United States uh, and so many other issues that really uh, drive home uh, the need for us to, to take care of ourselves because we're in this fight for the long term. Um, so for those of you that want to learn more about Dolores Huerta, please visit DoloresHuerta.org, learn more about her foundation. Today I'm wearing the Dolores pin. I'm going to just uh, make sure you can see it on the camera uh, and you can learn more about this pin and about all of her fantastic work at doloreshuerta.org. Thank you again to everybody who has uh, been in the planning committee and who has attended over the last three days. 
it has been a truly successful event. Despite all of the challenges that we're facing, it really gave us an opportunity to connect. I think all of us are truly emotional and so inspired right now, Dolores. So thank you, thank you. Gracias de todo corazón. And enjoy the rest of your, um, the little that's left of Hispanic Heritage Month. Take care, everybody. All right, thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you.